All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the BMZA's zoning hearings on July 13th docket. Uh, before turning it over to the chair, I just want to go through a few WebEx functions. Um, everyone who has signed in via the internet, you're considered an attendee. So right now, you do not have the ability to speak or for us to see you. So you are muted and you cannot unmute yourself. Um, you look at the bottom of the button, you'll see microphone and camera button features. There's also a chat feature. Um, you should be able to see myself and those board members, at least their names on the screen. When your case is called, what happens is I will make you a panelist and unmute you. If you can make your camera functional, go ahead and turn your camera on then and we'll be able to see you. Any attendee who calls in and wishes to testify, I'll click through the call in users and you will hear two beeps. If it is the case that you wish to testify on, please speak up before I move on to the next person. If no one speaks up after the two beeps, I will move on to the next caller. If you're unable to connect to audio, please use that chat feature. If your the speaker is inaudible, we, we will ask to um, for you to call back. So there's two ways to testify in support or opposition of a matter. Um, you can use the chat feature. Put a message in the chat feature, identify the case number, whether you're in support or opposition. You can do that when the case is called, so that way we're able to see it, because as you know, the chats are just a running script and we only see a little bit of it. Please do not use the question and answer, because I don't have the ability to see both the ch um, chat and question and answer. Please only use the chat. Also, there's a raise your hand function that will let me know if you wish to testify on a particular matter. The order of testimony will go as follows. The applicant goes first, followed by support, then opposition, and then the applicant gets the last word and testimony closes. Anyone speaking on any matter before this board is testifying under oath and required to speak the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If you have any issues with WebEx, you can call our office. The number is 410-396. 4301. There will be someone there who can hopefully help you when you call in. Um, do not call or email me because I will not be looking at my email during the hearing. If you are having technical difficulties and cannot participate, please email bmza at baltimorecity.gov with those technical difficulties and why you are unable to participate. Um, today's hearing, we have four members of the board. Cases will be called by the chair and we will proceed through the entire docket. Your case may not be called in the order that it appears on the agenda, so please remain alert. Um, and at this point, I will turn it over to our chair and we'll begin the hearing. Thank you, Ms. Byrne. Um, some of those technical difficulties include uh, video not operating for all of us and for me, that's the case again today. So you will not see me, but you hopefully can hear me. If you have any issue, please uh, let us know. Uh, the board will vote on each case uh, and typically makes a decision at the end of the docket. I say typically because there are times when um, either we'll need additional information or uh, any number of reasons may require that we defer deliberations uh, at the end of today's docket. But generally, that's what will happen. Uh, or when your case is heard today. Uh, you may stay on the line to hear uh, that deliberation, uh, but you cannot participate. In any event, you can call the BMZA office tomorrow morning after 9 a.m. to hear the result uh, of your case. That number is 410-396-4301. Uh, you should receive your resolution to the mail within 30 days. Uh, we ask that you not do any work until your resolution is received and uh, do not do any work in Baltimore City without pulling the proper permits. There is one, at least one postponement on today's docket. If we had a posting issue uh, for this matter, that is case number 2021-076, 6500 St. Helena Avenue. Uh, the appellants were Valerie and William Burke. Um, again, that matter, 6500 St. Helena Avenue. If you were uh, here today, signed in uh, to be heard on that matter, uh, that case will not be heard. That ought to be rescheduled. A later date. Uh, we have a series of cases that are on the consent docket. Uh, those consent cases are cases for which the board 
believes it has sufficient information to approve the appeal. So those cases will be called. Those cases will be called and uh, and resolved uh, in that manner. Uh, we do have. Um, I'm going to start with the case. At least you can see what we're going to do with this case. Case number twenty twenty one dash zero four five. It's the first one listed on the docket. Two five South Chapel Street. The appellant is Eden No. Uh, and we'll get Ms. No on the line uh, very soon. Uh, we have, uh, although we have four uh, board members here present today, uh, for this matter, there was one board member uh, who was not here to hear the beginning and the testimony that was already presented in that case. Uh, and therefore, we only have three board members for this case. Uh, in that situation, uh, the decision must be unanimous because that is uh, a different rule uh, than when we have uh, more board members than three, uh, the appellant will have the option uh, to postpone the matter uh, until such time as we have four board, more than three board members. Right. And we'll I, I, know. I do not see yeah. Ms. Snow's name, but what we have right. some of yeah. the users, so I will go ahead and see if she's one of our call-in users. Ms. No, if you're calling in and you hear two beeps, please speak up. All right, moving to the next caller. Moving to the next caller. All right, so the three call-in users were not Miss No. Miss No, if you are here, please raise your hand or um, please put a message in the chat that you are here under someone else's name. Uh, all right, hold on one second. Ms. Seguros, is Ms. No with you? No. Okay, thank you. So the question about whether or not to move forward only is with Ms. No. Right, right. Um, and she does not appear to be on the call. Right. Well, uh, we won't be calling that case right now then anyway. <laughs> so well, we'll just move on. Right, um, okay. Very well. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, consent docket. Uh, again, that will follow the procedure that I outlined uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, the first case on the consent docket is case number 2021-094, 500 South Lehigh Street. The appellant is Sean Harvey. And this is a request to add live entertainment to a tavern in a C1 district. And I'll hear any reports we may have from planning Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Martin French for the Baltimore City Planning Department. Planning Department has reviewed this application, including the supplemental statement that was provided uh, to us yesterday afternoon, and has determined basically that this is an approvable application. The department is recommending that approval be subject to these conditions specifically. Amplified live entertainment does not take place on and is not broadcast to the proposed outdoor rear deck on the rooftop of the first floor level of the premises. Copy of the use and occupancy permit for the premises must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. Copy of the written approval by the board of the live entertainment provided on the premises, including details of any restrictions or limitations on live entertainment provided must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. And a copy of all other permits and licenses required pursuant to the written approval of the board must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. French. Um, in reviewing the application, there are there is a specific letter of support from the Greek Town Homeowners Association and a petition with 108 signatures, all in support of the application for live entertainment. The last legal authorized use at this property was a tavern without live entertainment, and that was issued June 16th of 2020. So this is uh, an application to add live entertainment 
to an existing tavern in C1. And I have Sean Harvey, who is the attorney for the applicant. Mr. Harvey? Yes. Um, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, we can, just barely, Mr. Okay. Harvey. Uh, uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, were you, could you hear the uh, conditions outlined by Mr. French at the planning department? Yes, I did hear them. Okay, and, are those uh, conditions? They're acceptable. Are they acceptable to your client? Very well. Uh, yes, very they well. are. And also, I, I want to add, though, that this was also um, a petition or an appeal um, to authorize uh, the uh, expansion of the business from just the first floor uh, to the second floor and first floor, and then also to add a, a deck, uh, a rear deck, and that wasn't mentioned. That's not part of the application we had. We only had an application for conditional use. I did not see in the application oh, okay. submitted um, for any additional variances for construction. Okay. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? The application I did file did have that. Mr. French, do you have anything on that? The form that we received <clears throat> has this summary from the Zoning Administration Office, and I quote, expand existing tavern currently located on first floor into second floor. And that's the, the summary that's provided on there. Um, ADRs has a little bit more information. Uh, the owner applied for a use occupancy permit seeking an expansion of the tavern premises to include the second floor for business, including a remodeled second floor with a newly constructed second floor rear rooftop deck with trellis and emergency stairway exit and live entertainment, but was advised by DHC that BMZA approval was required. All right, so the only thing that our office reviewed then was the actual conditional use and the location from first to second floor. There was no evaluation of any kind of height variance, any anything like that that would have been required. Um, so I think at this point, the board only has the authority to approve the conditional use and the location of that conditional use within the building on the first and second floors. The application will have to be reevaluated by the zoning administrator to make a determination as to whether or not additional variances for construction are required. That analysis was not done. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, that does appear to change uh, the status of us being able to consent document. No, so the expansion of the use from the first to the second floor um, can be approvable by the board based on the application and documents submitted. Um, the live entertainment can be approved by the board based on the documents submitted. What was not reviewed or analyzed was if there are additional variances related to the construction. So Mr. Harvey, I'm happy to talk with you and connect with the zoning administrator on this tomorrow to see if there are variances regard related to the construction and if so we'll try to get you back in as quickly as possible okay thank you very much all right very well uh, i'll just add our magic words the board having heard your appeal we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal uh, for those matters uh, stated uh, by miss Byrne. thank you thank you uh next case on the consent docket uh, case number 2021-104 5110 Plainfield Avenue. The appellant is Takanya Cheeks. This is a request to use the premises as a large family child daycare with the capacity of 12 children. Now, here are any reports you may have. The planning department has reviewed this application and is recommending approval of this application. The uh, application uh, comment originally stated that it was. Uh, suggested the applicant contact the Parking Authority of Baltimore City and its staff's understanding that the applicant has in fact done so. So we recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fair. Um, again, this is conditional use daycare center child um, going from, let's see, a maximum of eight children, which was the last authorized use was a daycare center home. So now moving it to a regular daycare center of eight children um, 
I'm sorry, of up to 12 children. And there is no, um, now that the, the applicant did reach out to transportation and planning recommends approval as well. So let me find Miss Cheeks. There you are. Ms. Cheeks? I'm here. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Cheeks. Uh, Hi. How are you? Uh, Ma'am, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? Not at this time. Okay. Well, the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good luck to you. Uh, next case on the consent docket, case number 2021-106-1905 Dixon Road. Uh, the appellant is Greenleaf Construction. And uh, this matter addresses variance to bulk and yard regulations related to constructing a one-story addition. I'll hear any reports. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Uh, variance has requested a um, minimum interior side yard setback variance, 20 feet is required, four and a half feet is proposed. So ultimately the variance being requested is 15 and a half feet for the construction of a one-story addition and deck in R1B. Let's see if I can find the applicant here. All right, Mr. Nicholas Highland is here for 106. Mr. Highland, hold on one second and I'll elevate you to a panelist. There we go. All right, so uh, for whatever reason, I can't make you a panelist, but I will unmute you, Mr. Highland. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Highland. Um, uh, Given that you're here on behalf of uh, Greenleaf Construction, I'll ask, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time, sir? No, sir. Yes, sir. All right, very well. Uh, the board, having heard your appeal for 1905 Dixon Road, uh, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, thank you, everybody. Great. Moving on on the docket, uh, case number 2021-108, 1201 Windermere Avenue. Uh, the appellant is Leslie Dixon, and this matter addresses the variance required for six-foot fence height and corner yard setback along Edna Road. Are there any reports that we may have? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. So we have two variances being requested. Minimum side yard setback variance, 20 feet is required. Zero is proposed, so a full variance of the 20 feet. Fence height variance, three and a half feet maximum, six foot is proposed. So a two and a half foot variance is requested. There are four letters of support from neighbors, one from Lori Elzerode, one from uh, Brian Windle, one from Makila Ames, and one from um, Natisha Ortiz Fortner. And the applicant is Leslie Dixon. So Ms. Dixon, I will elevate you to a panelist. Ms. Dixon? Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? Just, just uh -oh. barely. Okay, I have it on the full as I can get. Can you hear me better? Uh, a little bit better. I think that might be sufficient. Uh, Ms. Dixon, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? Um, just what was basically stated in the letters of support. That the purpose of the fence is to enclose my two pets um, who are huskies, very active, and can clear five feet. And right now, don't have any place close to home that's outside and enclosed that they can enjoy their time. Um, we had severe issue with litter based on construction that was going on across the street from us. And of course, the issue with um, theft. Okay. 
Well, very well. I can tell you that the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Right. Great day. Okay. Uh, next matter on the consent docket, case number 2021-112. 217 through 219 South Central Avenue. The appellant is Adam Carballo. This is a request to use the second and third floors for a total of six dwelling units and required off street parking. I'll hear any reports from you. Thank you. The planning department has reviewed this application, noted that this property is uh, fully occupied or has total lot coverage by a building uh, which has numerous windows at the front. It also has windows on the upper floors, on the side walls and in the rear. However, because those walls are at the lot line and there's the possibility that the neighboring properties could be improved at some time and completely block those window openings, the department is uh, asking basically that the applicant consider whether in fact six dwelling units are possible under the terms of the fire and safety code, the building code and the housing code. The department has no objection to approval of a parking variance that would be based upon a one for one of the yield of the number of dwelling units that the applicant is able to provide in that building based upon compliance with those other codes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, again, mirroring what Mr. French had to say, this is a variance for off-street parking requirements for a newly constructed MFD in an IMU1 district. Um, what would be required would be a variance for one space per unit. Um, so depending on the, the number of units, um, I think, is yet to be determined based on construction drawings. And it looks like we have Hannah Breedlove here for Carvello Architects. Um, Ms. Breedlove. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, Great, thank you all. Sure. Uh, I'll ask you generally if there's anything you'd like to add, but uh, also could you, if you could speak to uh, the commentary that uh, Mr. French had from planning regarding number of dwelling units. What are yes. you proposing? Um, our office and the building owner are all aware that we won't be able to use those uh, windows on the property line as egress. They'll likely have to get boarded and eventually could be built, it, uh, built over by the neighbors. So our documents do show, uh, well, the most updated documents show six dwelling units, none of which use those windows as egress. So we are able to get six units in that are all legal and do not utilize any of those property line windows. Okay. Well, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add at this time, ma'am? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. So much. Thank you all. Uh, moving on, case number 2021-114, 2838 Hudson Avenue. I'm Matt Nofel. Uh, this matter addresses a variance to the bulk regulations related to the construction of a two-story rear addition with rooftop deck. I don't hear any staff reports or planning reports you Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Uh, only variance required for the, this construction is a maximum lot coverage variance. 60% is the maximum. 75% is what is proposed. So it will be a variance, a 15% variance that's being requested. We have a letter in support from the Canton Community Association. And uh, Mr. Nuffel is here for the applicant and we'll make him a panelist. Mr. Nofel? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Okay, so we're here on 2838 Hudson Avenue. Is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? Uh, no, there isn't. Very well. Uh, the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. So thank you for that. Uh, I note that you have two other matters on the docket. Uh, Mr. Nofel, if you could just hang on, we'll call those and, and so we can continue on. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. Sure. Uh, Case number 2021-126-1719 Covington Street. Again, the appellant is Matt Nofel, and this is uh, this matter addresses a variance to the bulk regulations related to the construction of a two-story rear addition and rooftop deck. Uh, and do we have any reports? Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. 
Uh, very similarly to the other application, this is a maximum lot coverage variance um, can, related to the rear addition rooftop deck construction. 15% variance is requested. Mr. Noble, you're unmuted. Yes, Mr. Noble, is there anything you'd like to add to this application, sir? No, there's not. All right. Uh, well, again, the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Now for the final one. Uh, Case number 2021-128, 1826 Jackson Street. And the appellant is Mr. Nofel, and this is a similar, uh, similarly addresses variance to bulk regulations related to the construction of a two-story rear addition and rooftop deck. And are there any reports for this? My yeah. department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Uh, again, it's a maximum lot coverage variance, 15% variance requested um, related to the two-story rear addition rooftop deck construction in R8. And, and Mr. Mr. Nofo, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, this application? No, there isn't. All right. Uh, so the board, having heard your appeal for 1826 Jackson Street, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. Next matter on the consent docket, uh, case number 2021-116, 808 East North Avenue, uh, William Brodus. And this matter addresses the variance to bulk regulations to use for two dwelling units. Now, here are any reports from you. Planning Department recommends approval of this application. Thank you very much. Um, this particular application um, the request is to use the premises as two mfds as an mfd with two dwelling units in r8 the land use card on file with department of housing community development shows an approval of the um, property as two dwelling units in 1982 and i will elevate mr brodus as a panelist mr brodus yes i'm here uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, Mr. Brodus, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? No, there's not. Uh, very well. The board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we on case number 2021-119, 2654 Maryland Avenue. The appellant is Kiosha Hall. And this uh, appeal involves a conditional use uh, to utilize ground floor as a beauty shop. Now, here are any reports we have from staff and their planning. Planning department has reviewed this application and recommends approval. Thank you. Thank you. The um, in review again, this is a conditional use for neighborhood commercial establishment of a beauty shop. We have a letter in support from uh, Charles Village, and Miss um, Hall is here. I will elevate her and make her a panelist. Miss Hall? Yes, I'm here. Uh, good afternoon, Miss Hall. Um, afternoon. Is, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? No, not at this time. Very well. Of the board having heard your appeal, you believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank, Thank you and good luck. Thank right. you. And our final case on the consent docket today is case number 2021-124, 226 Robinson Street. The appellant is Dave Kobach. Uh, and this uh, matter addresses the variance to bulk regulations related to the construction of a two-story rear addition with rooftop deck. Now, hear any uh, planning and or staff reports. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. There are two variances required for this construction. One, a minimum rear yard set rear yard setback variance. Twenty feet is required. Um, seven and a half feet is proposed. That would be a variance of twelve and a half feet. Maximum lot coverage variance. Um, Eighty percent is the max. 87.9 is proposed, so an additional 7.9% variance is requested. Um, Mr. Tobash is here. I will make him a panelist. Where'd you go? There you are. Mr. Tobash? Yes. 
Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Tobash. Is there uh, is there anything you'd like to add to your application uh, for 226 Robinson Street today, sir? No, there is not. Very well. The board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much and good luck. Thank you. Uh, that'll conclude the uh, consent docket for today. Turn our attention to the regular docket. Um, why don't we give one more shot to uh, 205 South Chapel? Um, Eden No, case number 221, I'm sorry, 2021-045. Ms. No, if you are here under someone else's name, please put in the chat who you are. I'm going to go through the call in users. I'm going to check again one more time for her. Do not see her. Um, but let's try the call in users. If you miss no, if you are calling in, please speak up after you hear two beeps. All right, moving to the next caller. Moving to the next caller. All right, it does not appear Miss No is here. Um, so that kind of takes takes it out of the board's hands a little bit as far sure. as um, so anybody I guess that's here for um twenty twenty one zero four five. I mean I, how do you guys want to handle it? Do you wanna wait to the very end, try one more time or do you want to yeah, try let's, to put it let's on do that. stock it? All right, wait to the yeah, end. Yeah, let's, okay. let's, let's defer so that we can give it one more shot, and then we'll see where we are procedurally at that point. Um, I'll ask Roxana to see if she can reach out to Miss No and have her join. Um, we'll try that as well. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Um, we launch our regular docket. Um, calling case number 2021-099. 923 through 925 Brooks Lane. The appellant is AB Associates. And this matter addresses variances to bulk regulations to increase from six dwelling units to eight dwelling units off street parking. I'll hear any reports we may have from staff and planning. Thank you. Yes. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is already authorized for six dwelling units. Had this application come directly to the board for the first time for six dwelling units today, it would have required a 39% lot area variance in order to have approval of six dwelling units. The application is asking for two additional units, which would require a variance of 55% of the lot area requirement. And the department does not believe that there is any unnecessary difficulty or practical hardship associated with continuing to operate this property as a six dwelling unit multifamily dwelling. The department therefore recommends disapproval of this application because the amount and proportion of lot area variance needed for approval is excessive in relation to provisions in the zoning code and would substantially increase the degree of non-conformity of the existing use of the property and this application does not include information that would justify approval of 55 percent lot area variance thank you thank you mr Carter. So the two variants being requested uh, moving to the eight dwelling units from six to eight would be a minimum lot area variance of um, 1,100 square feet per dwelling unit is required. Um, what's being proposed is 7,392. So that would be a four, 1,408 square feet requested. So they would need an additional 1,408 square feet lot area variance. Um, in addition, there would be two additional off-street parking uh, required for a total of eight spaces. Currently, I believe they have six. There is a letter from the Reservoir Hill Improvement Council Committee. Um, they voted three to three, neither in favor nor against. Um, so the, the community association was split on this. We do have a letter in addition from a Ronaldo Maxwell. Mr. Maxwell states um, he's opposing the zoning appeal and um, he responded back uh, that they've been able to capture a few pictures of 925. He can't envision where that parking spot would come from. It's an oddly shaped triangle if they envision tearing that 
tearing down that retaining wall and parking on that narrow wedge. I don't think there's enough room. Um, they plan on tearing down the wooden fence, maybe letting a car there. I think it'll block it again. He just doesn't think that there's enough spot. Um, the only other place to be a wide tree, they would have to remove that tree, it would be unsightly. So understandable, you've not been able to talk directly to any of the neighbors, um, but they are in, Mr. Ronaldo is in observation. I mean, in observation, is in opposition. And um, Mr. Barry is here for the applicant. Where'd you go, Al? Oh, is it Nate? All right. Um, so, Nate, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. I'm going to make you a panelist and unmute you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Prattle. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Prattle. Uh, tell us about your project, sir. Sure. Sure. Good afternoon, Nate Prettle. I'm a land use consultant here on behalf of the owner, and I'd like to um, provide some of the justifications required for the variance uh, being sought. Um, here, you know, we're asking for what seems on its face to be a significant lot area variance. However, not every dwelling unit created is equal. And in the existing conditions here, first of all, I should mention, this is a, an absolutely unique lot. There's a corner lot on an alley in a triangular shape with a very large building on it. Just the above ground floor area is roughly 4,600 square feet, roughly another 1,500 plus square feet on the basement where these two new units are being proposed. And the existing condition is five one-bedroom apartments and one two-bedroom apartments. So again, it's a total of six beds, or sorry, seven beds through these six units. You know, a dwelling unit can be anything from a one-bedroom to a four-bedroom. So these are smaller units. And the uh, purpose or the impetus for re this request is not really on behalf of the applicant. Just, these are low-income and affordable housing units um, the owner has been working with the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services, Healthcare for the Homeless, the Housing Authority for Baltimore City through their Section 8 program, as well as another um, low-income housing advocacy group called Project Place. And so these are the tenants, and the, my, my client has been receiving calls you know, every single week for years. I should mention he also um, has a long-standing relationship with this neighborhood, not only in this property, but many others. I think since his family, you know, really located from Europe post-World World War II to Baltimore, it's been a part of this area. They have another property um, with, that has had the same tenant since 1978 in, in this area. So this is something that was really a request from some of the affordable housing advocates in, in the city because he is a good actor, you know, has maintained responsible um, and successful low uh, low income housing units for quite a while, they always reach out. And so that's where the idea of adding these two units came from. The two proposed units, one is a one bedroom, one is a two bedroom. So that's a total of 10 bedrooms in a 6,000 plus square foot structure on a unique lot. I mean, the lot is in itself is smaller in comparison to the building than you will find on other lots. So there's the uniqueness and the hardship aspect but this for this this is an important project i think mean, three of his existing tenants are veterans that qualify through a a uh, hud program for low-income housing um and so that's sort of the the general um uh, purpose of this building you know in its place in the neighborhood and in baltimore city should mention in regards to the off-street parking we are proposing two additional spaces um, just as mentioned in that letter, they will require some improvements. I'd be happy to submit, you know, if the board wanted to make a condition of approval, should they, you know, uh, that's the way they decide, we could submit a site plan showing these two other spots. There will be some work required through a building permit and one uh, regrading on one of them, removing a fence. So we uh, do anticipate providing two off street parking spaces for these two units. So the way that I, uh, Look at this. We could have, you know, we, he could convert the existing six units into six four bedroom units as it is. That's 24 beds. We're only asking for 10. So the nature of the units itself uh, being smaller um, is part of the reason that I feel this variance is, is appropriate. Um, and the, back to the low income housing aspect, there has been a shortage throughout the city of one bedroom low income uh, units available. Again, so this this is the reason that we're um, requesting these variances. I think they're more than appropriate. Uh, the the variance, I believe, is also supported by the city master plan. Frankly, in the live section of the master plan, the goal one, objective one, is expand housing choices for all residents. 
you know, and that's exactly what the purpose of this is. It wasn't a uh, the owner looking to uh, uh, increase his income potential on the property. This came from outside, and we're you know excited about it. I would encourage the board to uh, approve this variance, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so, Mr. Preto, uh, is it your testimony that the additional units uh, will not be market rents, uh, no market rate, they will be uh, additional uh, low-income housing? That is correct. Support. Absolutely, that is correct. Hey, Katie, do we have any communication from DHCD or any of the affordable housing groups? We do not. We do not. Thank you. I guess just to summarize, again, we have a large building on a comparatively small lot with smaller one bedroom units. And this is the reason that the, the variance is appropriate, um, it, it, as well as adding the, the low income aspect of it in this compliance with the master plan. Any additional questions for Mr. Preto? No. Mr. Preto, do you have any anybody else testifying in support? Because we have uh, opposition testimony on the line. Um, no, I do not. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thornton. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sorry. So, um, we are neighbors on the block. Um, unfortunately, I guess other neighbors didn't join this hearing, but uh, we would just like to join in opposition to the appeal. Um, that property uh, is a source of nuisance for the for the neighborhood. Um, the additional parking, first of all, the block is already crowded as it is uh, with re regard to parking. There are uh, multiple apartment buildings in the area and they use the block for parking, which makes it difficult for uh, the current residents who currently live on that block to park. Additionally, that particular property um, has an excessive amount of trash in its trash units that overflows into the alley, which um, the other neighbors pitch in to clean up. Um, there have been complaints about that property with um, with rats and what did I miss? And the grass, the overgrown grass in that property. So we we are in opposition to um any more additional units being added to that to that property okay any questions for this gentleman no all right you have uh, anyone else uh Ms. Byrne? Uh, you muted, Katie. Sorry about that. Um, I do not see anyone else raising their hands regarding this particular appeal for Brooks Lane. Um, let's see, anybody else uh, for Brooks Lane? Either please raise your hand. Let me go through and look up one more time for those in the chat who've put their number next to it. Um, I'm going to go through the call-in users really quickly. If you are here for 2021-099-923-025 Brooks Lane um, and you hear two beeps, please speak. Going to the next caller. Going to the next caller. Hello. Are you here for 2021-099, Brooks Lane? Uh, no, actually, I'm here for 205 South Chapel. This is Eden now. Oh, well, I'm glad to see that you're here, Ms. Now. All right, hang on um, for user number 12. Just one second, ma'am, because we're on another hearing, so I need you to be patient. Number 12. All right, sorry about that. I just want to write that down so I don't forget where she is. Going to the next caller. I 
Okay, it doesn't appear to be any additional opposition. Um, Mr. Prattle, you are unmuted. Great, thank you. Um, the only thing that I would add is that you know, I will communicate with my client the issues that were raised with trash and make sure that if there are any, they are addressed. Um, from my experience, he has been a good actor, not only this property, the rest of his property. So I'll make sure that uh, attention is paid to that. And otherwise, you know, just reiterate the uh, fact that these are smaller units. It is not an overcrowding of the land, as I uh, explained earlier, and the importance of the low income housing aspect, along with the uniqueness and the hardship stemming from that, um, I would urge the board to approve the variance. Um, it looks like Mr. Maxwell has just popped up uh, in opposition. So, sorry, Mr. Pretto, we'll go ahead and unmute him. Hmm. All right, let me see if I can get you unmuted, Mr. Maxwell. Let me try to make you a presenter. Panel. All right, Mr. Maxwell, see if you can unmute yourself, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So you can hear me, sir. Um, I want to concur with the Mr. Thornton, one of my neighbors. And also, I like to uh, bring to the attention that um, in your old, Mr. Fields, in your old opening statement, you stated that no work shall begin up until the approval, proper building permit is, is obtained and they receiving the decision from this board. Um, in 2020, it was brought to the attention of the neighbors that this property wanted to go from six to eight. So um, we went by and spoke to some of the adjacent neighbors and informed them, find out if they had any information about this. And we were told, no, they had no information. Um, in conversating with them, we also find out that it appears that some underpinning work started to begin. So I will request that this board send someone out to check to see if this is correct, because there is appearance that some of this work has begun since 2020. Also, um, concurring with Mr. Thornton, yes. Um, this is a six unit, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I was under the impression that any building over four units should have a private sanitation department to pick up the garbage. This property <coughs> presently have four city garbage can, which to my knowledge, the city only gave one poor address. My neighbor's garbage can have disappeared. Every single one of this gentleman's garbage can is painted with this address. And on top of that, for six units, there's only one small recycle container. As Mr. Tolton stated, yes, we have a serious problem with this building with the garbage issue because there's no one small recycle bin for six units is um, not acceptable. So um, I will suggest, and I am um, against it, the um, extension of adding two more units, because for one, there's no parking. Um, Mr. is represented stated that they want to create parking and the side, and that's directly will be blocking one of the door entrance or exit, and it will be directly adjacent building, which I think will create a health issue in the long run. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm opposed of it, because as Mr. Totem stated, we already have serious parking issue already. And um, this building has been operating for with six units with no parking. So adding two more units, it will just make it where 
we may have to end up parking a block or two away from home if we find somewhere to park. So um, I'm against it, I'm opposed of it, and I think that um, this board should actually send a building inspector to check out to see if what the neighbors stated in 2020 was correct of the underpinning work that started in 2020. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Is that it for the abolition? Simon was just reminding me that I was muted. Um, I do not see anyone else in the chat for opposition. Um, and um, so, Mr. Pedal, I'll unmute you again. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, the only thing that I'll add here is we'd be happy to, if the board uh, wishes to approve this, uh, add as a condition that uh, my client will have arranged for private trash pickup. That was something he'd communicate during the community process, and we have full intentions of doing that. And the parking spots, yeah, we are happy also to submit a site plan showing those spots. It will not block any entrance or exits to the building. And uh, what do you know, if anything, uh, Mr. Perto, about the state of the construction regarding yes, you know, yes. toward eight, eight dwelling units? Yes. So to my knowledge, there has not been any work done. I would encourage HCD to send someone out there. Initially, my client had applied for a building permit to start this work. He did not obtain it. And that's when the zoning board process, you know, we began to explore that. And to my knowledge, no work has been done. We're waiting for this uh, you know, potential approval. But I would encourage send, send someone out there. That would be wonderful. Any additional questions for Mr. Prattle? No, I'm Hey. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's circle back to uh, case number 2021-045-205 South Chapel Street. Helen is Eden No. And this is a request to construct for a rear edition and third floor edition. And let me know when we have. Ms. Noah, are you on the line? Yes, hello. Uh, hello. Um, where we, we started with this matter, uh, you weren't present, but uh, fortunately you are now. So uh, here's our situation with regard to this case. Uh, the four board members who heard uh, the original portion of this case, uh, we are missing one of those members. We have a fourth board member, but uh, he was not present to hear uh, the earlier testimony. Um, and for that reason, we only have three board members who could deliberate and decide today on this matter. Um, okay. If there are only three board members who rule on a case, uh, that decision must be unanimous. It can't be split in order for it to be approved. Uh, so in that circumstance, we give the appellant uh, the option of postponing uh, the continuance of the hearing to further continue the hearing until such time as we have four board members, at least four board members who can rule uh, on the case. Uh, but it's it's up to you. You can go forward uh, with the understanding that an approval will require the unanimous decision of the three board members who can vote. Um, I see. Um, well, I mean, I think I'm okay. I mean, I, I would like to... I would like to, um, I think I would like to go on because like, when would be the next hearing? Two weeks from today. Two weeks from today? Um, oh gosh, it's so hard for me to decide. Is it possible you can come back to me and give me like five minutes to just five minutes to decide? Cause I just wasn't sure. aware of this. Is that okay? Right. okay? Uh, that's fine. We'll come back. Um, Right, yeah, moving on. Case number 2021-115. Uh, that is, uh, the property address is 4238 Frederick Avenue. Uh, the appellant is William Brodus. And this matter involves a variance to bulk regulations related to the use of the first and second floors of the multifamily dwelling, consisting of four dwelling units. 
uh, with off street parking required. I'll hear any reports we might have from staff and planning. Thank you. Planning department reviewed this application, noted that in 2014, there was a previous zoning appeal about this property. And the purpose at that time was to have a restaurant and three dwelling units on the combined properties, but that was postponed and not pursued further. The records available to the staff indicate the consolidation of 4238 Frederick Avenue with 4236 Frederick Avenue has not occurred, even though the consolidation apparently did receive administrative approval to go ahead. Uh, however, given that fact, the individual conditions of each of these properties would determine whether it's possible to have multifamily use of the property. 4236 has a previous record of multifamily use as two dwelling units. 4238 has a previous record of use as a single family dwelling unit and a tavern or restaurant in the basement of the building. Therefore, the department recommends disapproval of this application because the zoning code does not authorize conversion of a single family dwelling to a multifamily dwelling in the R6 zoning district where this property is located. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Thank you, Simon. The review of the application uh, by BMZA staff revealed very similar uh, results to what planning has discovered. It's actually a duplex and it looks like at one time it was there was an attempt at consolidation, but the consolidation was never completed. Um, so I, I believe the application was submitted believing that the, the duplex itself had been consolidated, but it was not. There is still um, 4238 Frederick as one unit, which has a dwelling unit above and um, restaurant tavern below and then 4236 that has a use approval for two dwelling units. This is R6 because the properties were never properly consolidated. Um, this board doesn't have the authority to add an additional dwelling unit um, for to, to basically combine. Right now, the two units have three dwelling units that have been approved and one restaurant. The board doesn't have the legal authority to do this because that would be a conversion and this is r6 and i have hey. mr brodus here yes i'm looking um i'm going to request yes i'm going to request a postponement because i'm looking at sdat and it has it here with eight full bathrooms and it's like it's combined as one unit um so i'm request a postponement so i can get the deeds and submit everything to the board um that I think is probably appropriate. Do we have do we have that's that records on our uh, available to you? Uh, we do. Right? So, Mr. Mr. Burtis is right in that some of the records show that it was consolidated, but city records don't show that it was consolidated. So um, there's a discrepancy in whether or not the properties were consolidated. So, Mr. Burtis, something else to right. think about. Even if they were consolidated, you have three dwelling units combined between the two that were previously approved. So there would need to be something else hanging out there to show that there's four dwelling units between all four, because the board doesn't have the ability to give you more than what was pre-existing. Okay, I understand. Uh, okay. Are you still seeking a postponement? Yes, I'm gonna seek a postponement. Um, I guess we can give them that opportunity. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, any, is that the board uh, okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Case number 2021 115, 4238 Frederick Avenue was postponed, be set in a later date. Um, all right. We'll move on to case number 2021 118. 5112 Ardmore Way. Uh, again, uh, William Rodas, and this is a request to use the premises as two dwelling units. Now, here are any reports we may have from planning and staff. Thank you. <clears throat> planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is located in the R3 zoning district, which does not allow multifamily dwellings. 
Therefore, use of this property as a multifamily dwelling is a non-conforming use. And as the zoning code provides, if a non-conforming use is being discontinued for 12 consecutive months, it is considered abandoned. There was a vacant building notice issued for this property in February of 2015, and there is no record available to planning staff indicating that that notice has ever been abated. If the applicant can provide information showing the multifamily dwelling use of this property has not been discontinued or abandoned, the Department of Planning would have no objection to the application. If this information is not provided to the board, the department recommends disapproval of the application as non-conforming multifamily dwelling use of the property would have been discontinued or abandoned and could not be reestablished in the R3 zoning district where this property is located. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, again, with this one, the request is used as an MFD with two dwelling units. And again, it is an R3. Um, because under the current zoning code, R3 does not permit multifamily dwelling, um, we then look at the history of the occupancy of the property. There's a land use card um, with Department of Housing Community Development Records that states that it was approved for two dwelling units in 1964. However, a vacant building notice was issued in 2015 and again reissued to the current owner on February 28, um, 2021, which indicates that the property has not been occupied since 2015. Um, in addition, we have a letter of concerns from the Walterson Community Association. Um, basically having issues with the discrepancy of uh, ownership on the permit application, Ms. Boone versus the appeal application, Whole Health LLC applicant um, on both is Mr. Brodus. <laughs> Unusual apartment layouts, which makes sense may suggest an intent to use the property as supportive housing. This is the case. They're concerned that Whole Health LLC is not currently a business in good standing and has had multiple forfeitures. Um, the property appears to be set up as two dwelling units and may or may not be currently occupied. Um, so let's see, our position on this property is the property should revert to single family status. This is because the property was vacant um, the whole time from 2015 to 2017. And if that is the case, then the non-conforming use would be extinguished. Um, and I have, uh, let's see, Mr. Brodus, you're on yes, on this, yes, yes, on this one. Yes, on this one, I'm going to request a postponement. They are active bg e meters there showing that it's a two unit building. I uh, will reach out to the person that has a complaint and see what their concerns are and I'll get y'all what y'all need. Okay. Um, are you aware, uh, Mr. Burns, of the, uh, of the, uh, the abandoned nature, uh, at least since 2015 of this property? I mean, did that was what the record show? Yes, I know there's people there, so I have to check into that part. Um, Ms. Byrne, is that the appropriate resolution of that? Or well, what Mr. Brodus, Mr. Brodus would have to prove that it never stopped operating as a multifamily. If there was approval in 1964, um, the, the issue is that there's a vacant building notice that was issued in 2015 that has never gone away. So Mr. Brodus, you would need to prove that the property was continually occupied as a two dwelling unit multifamily. Um, even after that vacant building notice was issued like that it's because of the non-conformity that this property cannot become a multifamily dwelling in r3 yes i understand but i still like to request a postponement if possible we'll give you every opportunity to uh present your evidence uh, okay thank you Okay, uh, let's call letter number 2021-122-1006 East Lake Avenue. Helen is Curtis Kelvin Robert. This is a request to use the premises as two dwelling units. Variance requires off street parking or and seeking the variance requiring off street parking. 
Are there any reports you may have? Thank you. The planning department has reviewed this application. Information available to the planning department indicates that this property was last authorized for use as a single family dwelling, which is a permitted use in the R6 zoning district. Wherever the zoning code does not authorize conversions uh, in the R6 zoning district, and therefore the department recommends disapproval of the application because the zoning code does not authorize conversion of a single family dwelling to a multifamily dwelling in the R6 zoning district where this property is located. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. In reviewing the historical land records, um, there is no land. We could not find a land use card. However, the Department of Housing and Community Development parcel information indicates that this property's use is as a single family dwelling. We could not find any indication that it was ever used as a two dwelling, as two dwelling units. And again, as Mr. French said, this is an R6. Conversions are not allowed in R6, either by this board or by city council. So I see Curtis Calvin Robert is the applicant. Um, I'm going to go through the call-in users. Mr. Robert, or if you're here as the applicant for 1006 East Lake Avenue, please speak up after you hear the two beeps. Hmm. Moving on to the next caller. Okay. Looks like there might be a hand raised. Let me see. I know Mr. Thornton and Mr. Maxwell, Ms. Petrovich. All right, no. Okay, let's see. Let me go to the next caller. One more caller. If you are here for 1006 East Lake Avenue, um, please either raise your hand, put your name in the chat. Okay. Um, I do not see anyone here for this particular property. All right. Uh, looks like we have a no show. Perhaps if I have a moment, we can recall it. Okay. Um, and before we get to Miss No, um, we also had, uh, there was a person who put opposition in the Q&A for um, the hair salon. So we've got Miss um, Kenesha Hall back on the line and the opposition is still here. So if we could recall that just so that we can get all the testimony on the record. Okay, this is 2021-119? Uh, yes. 2654 Maryland Avenue. Uh, recalling that matter, uh, applicant is Kiosha Hall. This is additional use to utilize ground floor as a beauty shop, and apparently we now have opposition. Right. Uh, Ms. Hall, yep. Yep. And I just met Ms. Hall, I just made you a panelist. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead and, and call the opposition now, ma'am. All right, so that's Mr. Crowley. Well, hey, you know what? Hang on for a second because uh, sure. we, di we didn't really ask Ms. Hall anything um, sure. since it was a consent case. Uh, Ms. Hall, uh, just tell us about your project and then we'll hear uh, the opposition. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so again, I'm trying um, to make the first floor um, into a beauty salon. Okay, um, can you keep your voice up, ma'am? I'm trying to make the first floor into a beauty salon. Um, okay. All the work that what needs to be done has already been um, like approved by the place, the people that I'm leasing the building from. Um, it's not like a full out renovation or anything. Just basically, I will be I will have to move the plumbing, um, move the plumbing a little bit um, in order to get the shampoo bowls working. But other than that, um, everything is perfectly fine. Um, I reached out to the neighborhood association, um, told them what my plans were, what my vision was um, for the property and um they didn't have any issue with it um I've, I've also you know seen some of my neighbors you know in passing and nobody seems to have a problem um i have normal business hours um for me i'm normally take either you know we'll be taking one or <clears throat> two persons at a time um just to like help with the parking um so i don't plan on you know disturbing the neighborhood or you know anything of the sort 
Okay. Well, what do you, what are your proposed business hours, if you know? Yeah. Um, 10 to 6, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So I will be taking my last person at 6 p.m. Okay. Will you operate uh, six days a week, seven days a week? Um, it will be um, Tuesday through Saturday, but it will be appointment only. I don't have any walk-ins or people walking in off the street. Um, people will have to actually schedule appointments. Okay. Are there any parking issues, uh, difficulties associated with that location? No, sir. That's for me. I, um, I didn't see any parking issues. I do know that there is like a um, two-hour limit until about 10 o'clock. Um, but I've ran a salon before. I'm pretty fast and efficient. So most of my clients are probably in here maybe, you know, maybe an hour or maybe an hour and a half, a half max. Any more any additional questions for Ms. Hall? No. Okay. All right. All right, now I'm going to find Mr. Crowley. There he is. Mr. Crowley? All right, Mr. Crowley, it doesn't seem to appear that your sound is working. Can you try to unmute yourself, sir? All right, so I do not have the ability to mute or unmute him. So, Mr. Crowley, I'm going to, you had put some issues in the question and answer. Um, so I'm going to read those. If you could type any additional concerns in the chat, and I'll read those to the board. Um, uh, Mr. Crowley has stated there's a significant garbage problem with the property, and he's concerned about how the shop will handle garbage on a daily basis because there's no place to store garbage. In addition, he had concerns about parking and events. Um, he lives on the block about 50 feet with the property and these are the concerns he would like to have heard. Um, so Mr. Crowley, if there's anything else, please put that in the chat. Um, but that is what Mr. Crowley asked uh, the board to hear. Uh, so Ms. Hall, while we have you, uh, do you have any familiarity with this property other than you know planning to utilize it for your business? Uh, yes. I do. I'm actually a, a familiar with the property and just as far as the parking situation, because I spoke with, um, you know, who, who I leased it from um, initially and I do appointment only. So there's only one person at a time being serviced. This is not um, a, a salon where there are going to be venues held or there are going to be multiple people in and out. Mm -hmm. Ever since COVID has happened, I've pretty much been appointment based for the for the past almost going on two years now so that is my intention to stay that way but there is parking on 2726 maryland charles so it's plenty of parking and regarding the the the, the trash situation as well they have yes, an alleyway where they have six trash cans in so it's multiple residents using that same that same alleyway, but there are plenty of trash bins. So me, me being one person coming in, being as though someone was already here, is not going to add or subtract to what's already been there or what's been here prior. It's been people in this building before me. Do you know what the business, was there a business operated? Yes, uh, there's uh, been several was... businesses operated in this building. Yeah, you know what the most recent business was? Um, I, it was a it was a boutique as well as some type of restaurant where they were servicing food because there was a kitchen, so there were yeah. multiple amount of people in and out of the facility, way more than I would have. Okay, safe to say you won't be serving food in your salon. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, obviously that that uh, I can understand how that kind of business can contribute to trash issues, but that's not doesn't appear to be something you would. Experience. Yes, I, I don't deal with food at all, and it's very <laughs> messy. Being as though you know, I'm more so using hair products. I don't accumulate trash. Okay. 
I'm not even going to be here every day, living here, eating here, things of that nature. I just come and do my work and that's it. <laughs> All right. Uh, any additional questions for uh, Ms. Hall, given the information from the opposition? No, I'm good. Okay. Very good. Ms. Hall, thank you. Thanks for staying on line. Okay, that will conclude case number 2021-119. Okay. Uh, um, now I think we're back to Ms. No. Uh, we received a message from um, Ms. Petrovich that they would like a um, postponement, but I'm going to get Ms. No here on the line. Ms. No? Yes, hello. Yes, uh, back to you, Ms. No. I would like a postponement, a postponement, please. Okay, very well. Uh, under our, again, under our rule, when there are three judges or three board members, uh, the decision must be unanimous, and that gives uh, the opportunity uh, for a postponement request uh, to be granted. So we will postpone this matter, and um, you can touch base with Ms. Byrne for when it will be reset. So I, I would like to just reset it for next week because we know that okay. Jay will be here and it will be right. the original board that heard the case. Um, so Ms. No, if you would please change your sign to indicate that the next hearing date will be on July 27th. Okay. And just a little bit of housekeeping, Ms. Byrne. Um, what we just did for case number 2021 122, 1006 East Lake. Yes. Um, oh, that was a no show. We didn't, we didn't hear no it. Show. Right. Um, let me just look again really quickly to see if that individual has popped up. I do not see Calvin Robert. I do not see any additional hand raises. I went through all of the calls. Um, so I think I think that one, um, we'll try to reach out to them. Okay. And we'll go from there. Very well. Uh, then we'll head to uh, the final case on the docket, which is case number 2021-095. Uh, the appellant is CR Properties, care of AB Associates. And NS, is that would that be the northern side, north side, west north avenue, west northern parkway, 306 feet 7 inches east of Falls Road. This uh, matter uh, addresses a height variance to construct a new three story structure used as a residential care facility with 120 residents uh, and 110 rooms. Off street parking will be required. Uh, I'll hear reports. I know we have some preliminary motions on this matter, but I'll hear any reports we have from planning and staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Planning department has reviewed this application. Notes this property is located within a planned unit development, and the planned unit development's development plans are subject to final approval by the planning commission. This particular property was the subject of a site plan review committee meeting and received approval with comments on June the 2nd of this year. And design review of the proposed residential care facility structure is continuing. The department is therefore recommending that approval of this application be subject to the condition that all construction, improvements, and landscaping on this property are completed and maintained in accordance with approved development plans for the planned unit development known as the Overlook at Roland Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, as mirroring what Mr. French has to say, this is to construct a three-story structure for residential care facility, 120 residents, 110 rooms. It, the zoning is R6, R1A. The variances or the variance requested is maximum building height. Um, 35 feet is the maximum, 45 feet is proposed. It would be a 10-foot variance for building height. And the board is required to approve a conditional use for a residential care facility of 17 or more residences in this zone. We have received letters in support from the Poplar Hills Association, North Roland Park Association, and Lair Stream Neighborhood Association. Uh, we have letters in opposition from Betsy Boykin, 
and Gwen McDonald. Um, as was discussed in the board's general meeting, there are um, really, I think I would separate them out into three preliminary motions to dismiss from Mr. Holzer in opposition. Um, so if the board would like to move forward with those preliminary motions, I'll get Mr. Holzer on as a panelist. Let's do that. Okay. Mr. Holzer? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon, Mr. Holzer. Um, let's see, uh, in order to present your motion, do you, do you need uh, you need to call any, any, for any testimony? You're just going to argue the legal issue that you've uh, asserted in papers. I'm, I'm going to argue a number of the uh, legal issues that I've alerted. I want to make sure uh, that my original motion uh, for dismissal uh, is submitted in the record, along with the comments that were provided Monday uh, by 1 o'clock in regard to the, uh, the conditional use and also the variance. And I would like to respond to the um, uh, the request uh, opposition to the motion for di my motion for dismissal. So uh, may I proceed? Sure, you may. Well, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I had a number of questions, but many of them have been answered by the board already. I understand that. Four members are serving on the board uh, uh, today at this hearing. And I also understand that uh, the documents which I have previously submitted both by the motion as well as on Monday before 1 o'clock will be entered into the record. So yes, sir. That, I'm sorry. So having said that, um, this matter goes back a number of years, and the original PUD application for this building and this property um, was uh, appealed by uh, a number of individuals, including my current uh, uh, client, uh, Mr. Hunter Cochran. And um, what happened was the circuit court uh, refused to grant the variance and and denied it. Uh, both Mr. Cochran uh, and also the other side, uh, we took uh, cross appeals up to the Court of Special Appeals. Briefs were filed, and at the Court of Special Appeals, uh, they have heard oral argument and are currently sitting on the case uh, preparing uh, a determination. I would point out uh, as an, uh, a crucial element of that proceedings at the Court of Special Appeals that Mr. Engel, counsel for the other side, stated to the courts, the judges of the Court of Special Appeals, that the, the building that we were dealing with is the same building exactly same building that we are dealing with in terms of this application. Um, and, and so as a result of that, we filed the, um, uh, the, uh, the motion for dismissal. And in that motion, it is uh, essential under Article 32, Section 5302C2 of the board's uh, rules that they may not grant or deny, may not consider an application for a major variance if there is legislation pending before the city council to grant the same variance. Now that is the substance of, of my motion. The opposite, uh, uh, the other side, filed this opposition to, to the preliminary motion. And I would like to clarify what they uh, indicated in their response, because it is really uh, a crucial for this uh, for this board to hear. Um, the Court of Special Appeals, as I said, has heard the argument 
and but has not decided. But they only have two possible outcomes in this particular case, as certainly the owner, the other side, has misrepresented the status of the PUD for a residential structure that exceeds the current height limit. There are only two possible outcomes for the PUD case. Number one, the Court of Special Appeals declares the PUD application dead. Or two, the Court of Special Appeals remands the PUD application to the City Council. In that instance, the City Council will indeed have to consider a height variance under the current regulation. Overlook is aware of this and has demonstrated that it prefers to request the variance from this board. In fact, it appears that this matter could be designated to affect the outcome of the PUD case by removing the City Council's jurisdiction to deny a height, uh, a height variance on remand under Zoning Ordinance Section 5-305C. Now, if they want to get rid of my opposition and this motion, the simple solution is to simply overlook, is to uh, simply withdraw the PUD application. Overlook's continued pursuit of the original building, strongly opposed by many of the neighborhood or most of the neighbors, is a complication and a matter of great concern concern to the Cochran. Now, uh, in order to uh, 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 satisfy or explain to the board, uh, I have submitted a number of exhibits on Monday as well. Mr. Cochran's new property ownership right, in addition to what he previously was an adjacent adjoining property owner, there is an additional land which he now owns that, that puts him in that context. There are pre-existing easements, which uh, uh, ex exhibit the desire to maintain the status and, and, uh, uh, of this location. Three, three, there are other uh, uh, care facilities by this developer who has used uh, much more land than they are currently and a different footprint was proposed by this property owner and sent to me uh, that they could have a broader uh, uh, footprint, which would then reduce the variance requirement. So in regard to that uh, motion, that's what I have to say there. And I had a second motion which basically says that under the board, uh, board rules, uh, C uh, period two period, it says that the applicant shall provide a written statement that demonstrates with adequate supporting evidence, evidence how the proposed plans or resulting structures or uses conform to the standards set forth in the zoning code of Baltimore City. That was originally never submitted by the, app, uh, the applicant at all. I had requested Ms. Byrne to uh, ask for or provide the information. She forwarded to me the exact same thing that had been online for a number of months and it does not, in my opinion, it does not properly, adequately uh, show the evidence that was being submitted. Now, what that means is the way I'm prejudiced by that factor is that I could not prepare or cannot prepare for this hearing uh, as to what explanations the applicant may utilize I'm sitting here, and I still don't know upon, upon which basis. As a result, if they come in and testify uh, to something, I will not have had the opportunity to review it and prepare a response to that. That's why, in, in regard to that motion, 
concerning the fa their failure to properly, under the board's rules, C-2, uh, to submit evidence, and I reuse, reuse the word evidence, not just suppositions, not just proposals, not just uh, a, uh, an argument or a statement, but evidence. So those are the, uh, those are the first two um, motions, and I'm not sure what the third motion uh, was that uh, uh, Ms. Byrne uh, raised. So the, your original preliminary motion for dismissal um, regarding the, um, let's see, so the two that you sent on Monday um, that referenced the insufficient information, and then you actually covered the legal argument from your original preliminary motion to dismiss already, I believe. Those, yeah. I separated them out into three. Yeah, you separated them into three, but in reality, right. the first and second one are pretty much the same. The point. same, yeah. Yeah, it's that, just one's that, conditional use and one's variance. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, and I am, uh, I know this is the motions part of this process, so uh, I do have other comments on, uh, as from a legal stand as to the variance request and the conditional use on the merits. Uh, of this hearing, but I, for now, I will let those motions uh, and my statements speak for themselves. Okay. Uh, All right. So, it, um, Mr. Alter, I just I just muted you just so we don't have feedback issues, and I'm I'm looking for. Um, let's see. I guess I need to. Who's here for? Um, um, your Al, or let me, I'm an Al, I'm going to make you a panelist. Yeah. Al, um, who's doing the arguing for um, the, the motions? I am Elliot Engel here on behalf of CR Properties Development LLC, the applicant. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, briefly respond to uh, what Mr. Holzer uh, argued. Uh, and what's really important is to correct the record to begin with. This matter doesn't go back uh, for quite some time. This matter is brand new. Uh, this application was filed in April of 2021. What Mr. Holzer is referencing is, a, is not an application before this board, was a uh, city council bill by a different developer regarding completely different plans concerning a completely different kind of development. Uh, that PUD that was passed has been vacated by the circuit court for Baltimore City. So for all practical purposes, uh, that matter, uh, there is no existing PUD. Uh, as I said, the circuit court has vacated the PUD and all parties before the Court of Special Appeals agree that the matter either should be remanded to uh, the City Council or not be remanded, but everyone's in agreement that the PUD uh, has been and should be uh, vacated. So for all practical purposes, there is no PUD uh, at all regarding this property. I'd like to briefly uh, address the argument that somehow this board does not have jurisdiction under Section 5-302C2. To be very clear, uh, that section provides that unless legislation has been introduced to approve a variance by ordinance, then the board uh, may grant or deny any application for a major variance. And this statute is very clear that the only time this board uh, loses its jurisdiction is only if the same variance that is proposed before this board is being legislated by the city council. Here, as I stated, uh, the city council is not and did not at any time uh, propose any variance uh, in connection with this property. In fact, the PUD provides very clearly, the PUD that's now been vacated, provides very clearly that no variance was required in connection with that PUD. Section 5-302C2 is very clear that the only time this court uh, I'm sorry, the only time this board uh, loses jurisdiction 
is only if a zoning variance proceeding is pending by city council. Certainly, section uh, 5-201A provides the city council with eight um, specifically de delineated types of zoning authorizations. One of them is a variance and a completely different one is a PUD. So accordingly, a preliminary motion to be to dismiss should be denied for the simple reason that there is no PUD pending at any time. Uh, well, I shouldn't say at any time. There's no PUD currently pending because that PUD has been vacated by the circuit court. That PUD that was legislated many years ago uh, did not involve any kind of a, a uh, zoning variance, and the uh, relevant section only deprives this court, this board of jurisdiction, when a variance. Uh, is proposed by the proposed by the city council. Of course, the plans are different, and the PUD dealt with uh, the old zoning code. While of course this variance is under the new zoning code. For these reasons, uh, Mr. Uh, Holzer's motion, preliminary motion to dismiss, should be denied. In connection with the second argument we've heard about some kind of prejudice, as Ms. Burns correctly noted already uh, in her email in response to Ms. Holzer. Um, the interpretation of what's considered adequate supporting evidence uh, is up to the board. There's no question that the applicant here identified the use required, submitted plans, and referenced the relevant code section for the variance. Accordingly, the argument that somehow Mr. Holzer or his client are prejudiced is completely without merit and again should be denied. And unless the board has any questions, I will conclude my argument. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Engel. Are there any questions, uh, Mr. Engel, from the board? No. Okay. No. I certainly don't have any. Uh, uh, Mr. Holzer, would you like to be heard and reply on the motion? Yeah. Yes, I would. Yes, I would. Um, uh, it, to say that the PUD is dead is a not only a misnomer, but it's not true. The uh, interesting thing, as I mentioned earlier, not only did the protestants take the appeal from the circuit court to the Court of Special Appeals, but so did the other side. There were cross appeals in regard to that. But even if that had not happened, what has occurred at the Court of Special Appeals where Mr. Engel, and I have the transcript from the uh, Court of Special Appeals argument, stated at the Court of Special Appeals in response to one of the judges requesting him, it is exactly the same building. That question was asked by the court, not by me, and he gave that answer. So, uh, if, if what he is saying today is true, then simply, Mr. Engel, why don't you withdraw now the PUD application uh, and we, we'll be done with that and we won't have to worry about it. But however, you are still sitting there waiting for the Court of Special Appeals to declare either the PUD is dead, which you could voluntarily do, or what you are hoping will happen that they will remand just that portion of the PUD issue. They will remand that uh, to the city council. And, and instead of the city council reviewing the variance requirements under the current new law, you would prefer to have this board. And I would, I would uh, suggest to the board that I don't think that is proper motivation on his part to presume that he has a better chance of winning before you than he does before the city council who originally passed the PUD to begin with. So we still have a PUD sitting there unless Mr. Engel this afternoon on this show, on this television procedure, simply withdraws the PUD application. And then I'll, with, I'll withdraw my issue if it's gone, but it's not gone. Now, number two, in regard to the uh, submission, 
I read uh, the, uh, Ms. Burns' email to me, and you know what it said? It said, oh, we've always done it in the past this way. Well, as someone who has been appearing before uh, at the actual hearings, not virtually, but actually coming to the uh, uh, your uh, hearing room, the meeting room, under that under that circumstance, um, it it just seems to me that I would normally have the opportunity to analyze the evidence that they're going to submit and have a chance to rebut it or reply to it or consider that, yes, maybe it's okay or no, maybe it's not. But under the virtual procedures that we're stuck with now, at least uh, uh, until maybe August or September, I do not get that opportunity. I don't know what they're going to say on the merits. I don't know what they're going to present on the merits. I am stuck with what was previously submitted, which does not relate to evidence, evidence. So the way I'm prejudiced, and they know it, is the fact that they can say whatever they would like to say on the merits. And I probably, under the board's procedure, if I'm correct, is that they have the last word. They always get the last opportunity to speak under the board's rules. So they can, they can counter whatever I have to think about within just a few short minutes I have to hear their evidence and testimony. That is not fair. That is not due process under the normal uh, administrative procedures and hearing, hearings that we're all familiar with. So yes. I am prejudiced. Yes, I am put in a position of totally being defensive uh, in regard to whatever they happen to say. And so for that reason, I believe that I should have the opportunity to understand what evidence they are going to present and be able to either agree with it or not agree with it and counter whatever it is they're suggesting. So, Hold on, Mr. Holzer, I have a question for you, sir. I have a question for you. If we were not virtual, but we were live, and uh, Mr. Engel, uh, in representation of his client, appeared before the board, uh, wouldn't he have the opportunity to make the very same arguments live uh, and then put you in a position of having to respond to that that he would do virtually? What's the well, difference? That, well, that's, uh, it, clearly there's a difference. Because procedurally, the board has been doing what he's, he accommodates the applicant all along. Yes, if you complied with the rule that required evidence being submitted prior to the hearing date, it would be different. And if I was standing in front of you uh, in your normal hearing room, I would, have made the, I would make the same argument. It is not fair to spring on me when the code section uh, board's rules, C2.2, say it has to be evident. How long have you been doing this where you don't require the evidence to be submitted before the hearing? I can tell you, you have not been doing it. And it's about time that the board read its own rules and come to the conclusion that you need to have more evidence in the application submitted and not just let somebody come in, walk into City Hall, walk into uh, the city office building and talk to somebody in planning or zoning and then, and then be able to submit something and it ends up in front of this board. I have never, and I've uh, practiced law in almost every jurisdiction in this state, I have never seen a situation like that where it's not presented early enough for any citizen, any protestant, anybody in opposition to be prepared for the hearing. I'm sorry that I must make that speech, 
But that's in response to your question. And yes, if I was standing in front of you instead of virtually, I would make the same argument. But by vir in this virtual hearing, it is even worse because I'm not standing fr in front of you. I'm on this video. I'm trying to uh, articulate something that may or may not be accepted by the board. Whereas if I'm standing in front of you, I can talk to you directly as, as individuals and as board members. So yes, I, I am concerned about this issue in not just a virtual hearing, but also practically speaking. But I'm stuck in a virtual hearing, so that, that applies more so uh, than if I was standing in front of you. So thank you very much for the opportunity to reply. Thank you. Uh, so we had this preliminary notion um, uh, before us uh, for the board to determine whether or not, I guess, this application ought to be uh, uh, dismissed outright. Um, board, feel free to weigh in, but uh, I'm unpersuaded by the, by the uh, arguments in the motion that it ought to be dismissed, and I believe we have a right to hear it, and I believe it's properly before this board. Uh, so that we can go ahead and hear the matter on its merit on the merits. Um, I, I agree. I agree. I agree as right. well. Okay, and so with that, uh, we will go ahead and hear from uh, I believe Mr. Angle um, on your application, sir. Yes, thank you. I will uh, now move to qualify Mr. Al Barry as an expert in zoning and planning, as uh, the board is well aware, uh, Mr. Barry has been qualified as an expert before this board and before courts uh, throughout the state of Maryland. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Barry. And I will, let me just present for one moment his uh, resume for the board. Let's see, if, Eric, do you wish to present on the screen? Yes, please. Okay, I need to pass you, you got the it. ball. All right, mm -hmm. so hold on one second. I'm going to pass this to you and you should be able to accept it as a presenter. There we go. Thank you. And on the screen, you will see Mr. Uh, Barry's resume. Uh, as you can see, Mr. Barry has over 24 years of experience. I think the 24 years is probably the last time Mr. Barry updated his resume. Yeah, I think it's, the playing part. <laughs> and it's, it's a lot longer than that here. But as I said, he's been qualified as an expert before this board and before uh, courts in the state of Maryland. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Barry. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good afternoon, uh, members of the board. Uh, I want to organize quickly how we're going to present today. Um, it's a case which should be very simple for the board to hopefully approve today, but because of the uh, concern and the uh, opposition by Mr. Holzer and his client, uh, we're going to go through a presentation to, to build a record, as you can understand. Yes, sir. You're going to hear from uh, the development team, which is out of state, but which is all uh, remotely on, on this call. And that will be uh, two people, Cliff Bates, and Matt Grenfeld, who's the attorney for the developer. Also, Daniel Jealousy will be presenting. And we then have the architect, Sam Chung. Some of these people should be signed in already. So we'll, at the right time, you can add them to the call. I'm going to be then presenting arguments live through a professional planner uh, position. The board has the uh, ability to, and this, this application meets the standards for approval. 
Uh, we also have Jared Barnhart, who's here with the civil engineer, who's prepared many of these exhibits that we'll present to you to basically support our argument uh, for approval. Um, as Mr. Engel indicated, forget the planning and development. I'm sorry that that has to confuse the situation. This is a new zoning code. It's a new application. It's a new, it's a new building altogether and a new use. And so uh, the earlier arguments were uh, incorrect to try to confuse the two. Um, this hearing today is going to focus on a three-story, 110-bed residential treatment facility for up to 120 people for both assisted living and memory care residents in an R6 zoning district. This will require conditional use approval and a height variance for a building over 35 feet. While the building is only 35 feet in actuality to the roof line, the variance is only due to an unusual methodology of how the code uh, requires height to be to be um, calculated. In addition to the reasons you'll hear after you hear more of a presentation of the background, you will hear um, the project team has worked diligently with the neighborhood associations who you will hear with come with later to reach a series of agreements. And those agreements are quite extensive and concern the building. They concern the height of the building. They concern the preservation of the property. Uh, and these are in many of these people that are in support that you'll hear from were actually litigants against the PUD. And I think that's important to remember as we uh, as we hear uh, why this is an important facility for the neighborhood, much less Baltimore. What you're looking at is a site rendered site plan that shows a three story residential care facility. The property is approximately 12 acres. It has split zoning between R6, which is toward the front, toward Falls Road, and R1A, which is to the back. You can see from the aerial photograph that this rendering is on how the, uh, the condition of the property is quite wooded. This residential care facility was actually proposed to be built essentially on a shelf where a previous apartment building back in the 1960s was proposed to complement the falls. The falls is a 238 unit, nine story apartment building fronting on Falls Road. You can see it's the immediate neighbor and the closest neighbor uh, to this new building. Um, before we go into any of the arguments why we meet the conditional use standard for this building, as well as the variance standard, I'd like Cliff Bates to then give a background of his development team and uh, their experience and why this is important for Baltimore. Cliff? Al, you were muted for just a moment, so I just unmuted you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Cliff? Cliff, can you? Maybe needs to get access. Oh, you need to get him on, Katie? Muted, Katie. Who are you asking to put on now? I'm sorry. Uh, it will be signed in, I think, Cliff Bates. Cliff Bates. All right, Mr. Bates, I'm going to make you a panelist, and then I will be passing the ball to you, Mr. Bates. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah. So look, I'm glad we get to present it to you. Uh, like Al said, my name is Cliff Bates. I'm a principal with CRP Development. Um, we're the development arm of Claiborne Senior Living Communities. Um, we began developing communities in Mississippi, which is our home base. And when I say develop, we, we develop communities and we own them and we operate them. So we're full service. We have, um, again, development and we pass it off to the management team and then we own and operate these communities. So throughout the last decade, we've expanded our footprint throughout the Southeast, got out of Mississippi 
and now we're kind of working our way up the East Coast. Um, we've been in this process for a little while, so I've been asked a lot how we ended up in Maryland, and the answer is data, data analytics. So we developed a proprietary mapping tool that combines population, income, life expectancy, and unmet demand to identify specific areas with the greatest need for senior housing. So if you think about it, think of a digital map on your wall or whatever. And when we when we click when we click the inputs on the country, the areas with the greatest need kind of light up. Um, so we refreshed that map annually with new data. And when we refreshed it about a year ago, the DMV area just lit up like a Christmas tree. But really specifically a two mile a two mile radius in North Baltimore specifically the North Roland Park and Poplar Hill area, by our metrics, was the top spot in the United States. So after an extensive search for a development site, we landed on the parcel we're talking about today, this large 12-acre wooded parcel. Um, you know, it's a challenging site topographically. There's no doubt about that. But it's really ideal for senior living because we've got you know, you'll see in a minute, but there's an area of disturbance where the buildings go in. And then after that, we've got a really large undeveloped tract of land that is going to remain undeveloped forever. It really creates kind of a wooded forested setting for the residents, which is, as you can imagine, perfect for this use. So from that aspect, it's, you know, our proposed use seemed like a logical fit for the site, given you know, it's relatively low density for the zoning, this R6 zoning, and we create minimal traffic for a high density zoning. So at that point, we, we negotiated contractual terms with the owner and went to work to begin designing the facility. So as an aside, like I said, we're, we're owner operators. So we develop real estate, but at the end of the day, we're in a customer service business. And we operate a facility that provides a high level of care to residents to relocate from the surrounding community, typically about a three mile radius. And if we don't provide top notch customer service, our reputation is going to be tarnished in the community and that just can't happen. Therefore, one of the first steps in the development process is for us to engage with community stakeholders in the designs of the building that gets built in that community is ultimately representative of the people in the surroundings. So to that end, after drafting initial sketches, we began the community associate we engage the community associations within the close proximity to the site to begin a dialogue about our proposal. And I, you know, I've got to say, the community organizations that we dealt with, you know, specifically Bob Williams, Jay Newman, Doug Schmidt, you know, their organization and coordinated effort from a, from, you know, with multiple organizations was really like nothing I've seen in 20 plus years of developing real estate. I mean, they are really, really fortunate, these communities are, to have people like these guys that spent the amount of time, you know, basically freely uh, to design, the to, to help us with the design, the layout, how the land would be treated going forward. And, you know, it, they're a testament to their community. There's no doubt about that. So that's a little bit about us. Um, I think we're going to dig into the plans and um, and the details a little bit more with our architect team. And I'm happy to answer any questions or or uh, turn it over to the architectural team if there are no questions. I'm good. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you may have to notice. Sorry, who would you like us to call next? You yeah, have Sam. Yes. So I will move uh, Mr. Chung to a panelist and pass him the ball. Is that correct? Yes, that's yeah. right. Here. Okay, Mr. Chung, I believe you should have the ball here now, and you are unmuted, sir. Yes, hello, review board. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Can you can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, just fine. Okay. I'm going to do a quick screen share here. Screen share. 
Um, so my name is Sam Chung, project manager of Arrive Architecture Group. And in state of Maryland, we are licensed as John Mark Tolson Architecture LLC, where uh, Mark Tolson is the owner and managing member, 100% ownership. And um, we have specialized and we continue to specialize in senior living, assisted living projects all across the country. And we have a number of projects currently that are works in um, Virginia, South Carolina, um, over on the east side. Um, this, this rendering here um, shows you and it kind of tells the story of um, our current project proposal of the three story 110 units assisted living facility um, going to be primarily constructed of metal and steel uh, cladded with brick and cementitious lap siding. And I'll show you um, the building elevations here. And if you guys can, I know I know the numbers are a little bit difficult to read, but the colored building elevation shows the architecture vocabulary of what we're proposing to use. And um, you can you can sort of see um, the building heights, which I'll which I'll explain a little bit later um, in my presentation as well. But um, I would like to kind of emphasize the fact that uh, we've been working with the neighborhood community. Um, and um, also with the neighborhood community hard architect, um, pa Paulina Ilieva. Um, and uh, we have addressed two design reviews with this um, architect of the community into evolving a project into an acceptable architecture vocabulary that satisfies the character of this general area. Um, we, we first had begun as a lot more modern architecture than what is shown proposed here and um the feedback from the community and 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 paulina was that it was a little too modern and she wanted um to see a lot more federal architecture vocabulary um and so um going through another iteration which showed a lot more traditional approach um then we came up with this third um line iteration that was um completely satisfied and satisfactory to the um, the community board and this architect. And so um, the design vocabulary sort of speaks for itself, but um, it, 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 it derives from the federal architecture um, that is prevalent through Baltimore, um, which, which we were asked to do. And so I just wanted to emphasize that uh, we've been paying attention to the community We've been paying attention to the, the scale and the vocabulary requirements of what really they wanted to see. Um, this slide here shows us that one of the neighborhood's major concern was the uh, north screening element towards the Cliffhurst Road. And um, and what we what we have proposed, what we have proposed is that there is a quite a bit of a buffer here um, in the existing landscapes, um, in, in the existing landscapes before we get to the neighboring um, the neighboring houses. And also also this um, screening landscape plan here shows that we are um very we, we are going to be providing a screening element of new proposed trees to even further augment that there should be quite a bit of screening between the neighboring properties at that corner right there and um, finally this height diagram here i wanted to present um tells you uh, the the comparison of what we're really up against with the falls um apartment um which is our which is our adjacent neighbor and 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 really here as you can see at the falls apartment that panel structure is at elevation 354 feet 10 inches and um and even our tallest parapet really is approximately 11 feet uh, below that, below that highest um, elevation of the neighboring property. So, so this sort of gives a context that compared to the neighboring structure, even our tallest parapet is 
much, much lower in comparison. Uh, not to mention the roof, uh, the, the, peep, the peak of the actual flat roof is about nearing 35 feet. Um, some of the other um, some of the other slides here shows uh, that we have a very competent landscape architect that we're working with to really beautify um, the interior courtyards and the surrounding landscapes of what is being provided for the um, um, for the amenities for the residents within the assisted living facility as well. So that really. Um, wraps up my my presentation thank you so much more team thank you mr chair yes can we take a five minute break absolutely um yeah folks can just hold what you have and uh we'll uh regroup and uh what time is it now right sure uh, come back to 3 15 is that okay very well. Thank you. You good? Awesome. Uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, picking up with Mr. Barry. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, we're ready to back on the record. Katie, you're muted. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I just. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Barry, I just passed you the presentation, Paul. Okay, so just to uh, go through with the rest of our presentation, you're going to hear from myself and then uh, Jared uh, Bernard, who's the civil engineer, and uh, particularly with respect to some of the uh, drawings that you'll see that amplify the uniqueness of this property. As the board knows, the conditional use standards recognize that these uses are deemed to be permissible, if not detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare. The board shall examine site conditions and determine if the proposed use impacts these conditions, if any, in a negative way. My professional opinion that the proposed use on this unique site is entirely appropriate with no negative impacts on the surrounding community, as witnessed by the extensive agree community agreements that includes several adjacent neighbors. I would point out that Mr. Hunter, Mr. Holzer's client, has been involved in those meetings and discussions uh, throughout the process. The site is, as I said earlier, the site's approximately 12 acres, with the front part being R6 next to the uh, Falls apartment building and R1A, which is a very restrictive uh, zoning. R6 could be developed for up to 148 multifamily units and the R1A for three single family homes. The property is, as you can see, is undeveloped and steeply sloped. You're gonna see some examples of that later on. You could see from the photographs, some hint of that, uh, with large ex areas of existing growth of trees and vegetation, the majority of which will remain. Uh, we estimate that approximately 70% of the site is going to be undisturbed. The proposed three-story uh, three building uh, sits over 250 feet away from the nearest homes, several of which, as I said, are parties to these community agreements. The development also received preliminary approval from the City Site Plan Review Committee, as you heard from Mr. French, on June 2nd. Uh, the proposal is also in conformance with the City's master plan that calls for a recognition of the growth of older adults as a percentage of the city's population and the need to provide programs for them to help maintain their quality of life, as you heard Mr. Bates uh, testify to. The character of the neighborhood lends itself to a quiet transition building of this type, with large single family homes on one side adjacent to the R1A zoning and the nine story apartment building, which is owned R8 on the other side. By choosing to place the three story building only in the R6 zone, leaving over 70% of the site and the R1A zone undisturbed, the building conforms to the zoning pattern of the neighborhood. As to the variance, the variance requested is only necessary due to an anomaly in how the zoning code measures height and was not caused by the applicant, one of the standards by which the board should consider variances. The prior code measured height from the adjacent grade immediately adjacent to the building. However, the current transformed Baltimore code measures height 
from the uh, average grade of the nearest street frontage, in this case, Northern Parkway, the property fronts on Northern Parkway, and the average grade of the street frontage is 279 feet. That is over 480 feet away from the proposed building. Using this current method, this building on the property, including a single family house, would be limited to only 14 feet in height without median variance. And since the proposed roof, as you heard Mr. Chung testify to, is approximately 35 feet to the roof line, exclusive of the screening and decorative parapets, the variance is consistent with the intent of the code, is only required by the code definition itself, and should be approved due to the clear uniqueness of the property's topography. All of these clearly meet the code standards for an approval. I'd like to turn it over to Jared to uh, uh, give you some of his work that uh, dramatized the uh, height differences between the uh, various buildings and uh, grades. All right, I'd like to start with this uh, very simplistic exhibit that if looked closely at, it defines exactly what Al tried to describe. In that the mean elevation along Northern Parkway, and that's that frontage along Northern Parkway where the property is, line is, is 279 feet. The maximum building height allowed is 35 foot above the mean elevation. That gives you a maximum building height of 314 feet. Our building first floor elevation is at 300. That makes the permitted elevation at 314. And we are here at the very top of our parapet at 343.958 inches. Al did mention the distance from the right of way over to the edge of the building. That's at 482 feet. If we look back to this, that midpoint in ele mean elevation is somewhere along this. Can you see my um, my cursor? For sure. Cursor, yes. So that distance is all the way measured from that point. We look at some sections that we drew from various properties around the building. Here's a section one that's coming then across Clifford's Road. So this is from the, the north looking kind of southeast running through and it shows that when grown, the landscape plantings should do a pretty good job of screening the edge of that building from that property during the winter months. And we know what it looks like during the summer. Northern Parkway looking back to the building, you've got this hill in front of you where this, this section was taken. And there's no possible way that you're going to see that building um, in any season. I've got one more exhibit here. Here we show existing building looking back across Clifford through two different stands of trees and sight distance even from the building is blocked from the house. And the house in the winter might be able to see the top of the building but will not be able to see the edges of the building. And then here's a section from Falls cutting back straight through that gives that another representation of how the existing building sits and compares to where the proposed building sits. And then the light of sight from the rear rear property. I'd like to move into a couple of items just to describe the property. Property boundary is hard to see on this, this plot, but it runs generally here it curves up in a very odd shape and then comes back down into a sort of peninsula of land, then shoots back up, comes around, and it zooms all the way around this way. It's one of the oddest pieces of property, I've, shaped pieces of property I've dealt with. It varies in height from 258 foot at this bottom left-hand corner all the way up to 362 foot at this corner, it's 104 foot of elevation change across this property in the middle of Baltimore City. It also, part of the adjacent parking for the Falls building is lying within the bounds of this property and is 
put across as a private parking easement. It's also not something that you see very often where another property is supporting roughly half of a car parking. So that concludes what I have to say about the uniqueness of the property and, and also the heights. And I'm, I'm open to any questions that come up. Okay. <clears throat> any questions from the board at this point? I'm, I'm good. Uh, so, um, before we sum up at some point, after we hear all the testimony, I believe uh, Bob Williams had signed in and some of the other neighborhood association presidents uh, to give you their views. I believe they've submitted some documents of the agreements and they can tell you about the status of those agreements. And again, I'll point out that Mr. Cochran, Mr. Holzer's client, has been involved in those uh, meetings, certainly in community meetings and discussions. Okay. Uh, so, Al, would you like to to move now to um, so this is, this this concludes your testimony and you're ready for support? Yes. Yes. All right. I see, I see Mr. Williams here, so I will unmute him. Mr. Williams. Yes, I'm here. Um, does this video work? Hold on, I have to make you a panelist. I'm not as shy as some of your other panelists. Okay. All right, Mr. Williams, you should be able to turn your own camera on. There you go. Okay. Um, great. Well, hello, everybody, and we're happy to be here. Um, I would start by saying that there are a number of community associations that are adjacent to um, the property and the proposed facility. Our association, as was sort of hinted at um, by Al, was started to oppose the PUD. Um, we thought the PUD was too big. We thought it was too far up the hill. We thought the city had perhaps missed the part of adjacent that includes the properties surrounding it that are not the Belvedere, now the falls. And we were pretty adamant against that development. We do not, however, think that the property owner has no rights to develop a property merely because it's nice looking, conveniently situated for the neighbors and hasn't been developed for a long time. The property has, however, been controversial uh, since at least 1960, 61, uh, when the neighborhood opposed the construction of the Belvedere um, that created a number of neighborhood um, covenants that protect the neighbors from the Belvedere incursions, and they still, they still, um, they're still there. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is um, Mr. Holzer's client certainly knew everything we were doing. He was not in all of our sessions. He was in all of our public meetings, and he had an opportunity to comment. We know, we think we know pretty much his position and we know he opposes this and we know that's his right. So I, I wanna just clear up that he hasn't been sitting at the table and now is, is opposed. So when we look at this proposal, um, we, we think this is the best likely outcome for developing this, um, this particular parcel. And we think that for a number of reasons, one of which is that um, assisted living for seniors is not something that anyone objects to in our neighborhood that we've heard from. And we think that the rule concerning um, how you measure the height of the building uh, will likely be changed. It was attempted to be changed last year and I'm told by planning and others that it will be again brought forward this year. So we think at the point that happened, this, this would be a relatively small lift to ask for what would now be a six or eight foot variance in height uh, and a conditional use. When we oppose the other building and when we think about this building, we were thinking about traffic, we were thinking about the impact of parking uh, the other building proposed a road, not just into Northern Parkway, but all around the site and running down 30 or 40 feet next to Cliffhurst Road. It was proposed to change the entrance of Cliffhurst Road 
and their Sabina Matfeld neighbors very much objected to a new slug of traffic being positioned right across the road from Matfeld Avenue. And we look at a road, Cliffhurst Road, with five or six cars a day, and we expose it to a half of the potential traffic from a 250 car garage. So we didn't like that. And we see none of that. Um, we see none of that in this proposal. In this proposal, we we have had extensive conversations with the developer. We do like the fact that it's owner um, owner built and owner operated. Uh, we have talked to them. The other associations are Sabina Matfelt, uh, Poplar Hill Association, and North Roland Park Association. We've also talked to and interacted um, a fair amount with the Roland Park Civic League people, including especially Andy Niazzi, who's an architect who also helped us looking at these proposals. We paid some attention and Claiborne paid some attention to how this project would look from Marymount Avenue in Roland Park, which will be the, the people that look directly down on the building with no with no trees in the way uh, that we can see. We considered there's substantial runoff on that hill and on the Cliffhurst Road now. We talked about that. There were some design changes made to accommodate that. We, we talked as the architect, Mr. Chung told you, we, we had an extensive process of commenting on the architecture. This came from a neighborhood meeting where a lot of people and I would say a very direct way criticized the look of the original uh, proposal, and that was taken seriously. This building appears to have about half the mass of the prior proposal. There was another proposal that didn't get too far that would have covered the entire site, the lower site, and part of the upper site with townhouses that were proposed at four stories. Um, that would have been much more intrusive. Um, the limits to the building, the dotted line around the building in our uh, in our documents are, are 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 in perpetuity. They cannot build another building. They cannot build on the unused part. They must comply with whatever the city um, uh, provides in the conservation plans and in the upkeep plans. And they've agreed with us to do that annually. Um, the access will be from Northern Parkway and Falls Road on the south end of the Belvedere, the Falls, uh, only. Um, it's possible to get through the north exit, but that will be discouraged and it, it won't be permitted for, um, for employees. The construction of this building will be steel uh, as opposed to wood. I know there are a lot of three-story wood buildings. We like the fact that it's a steel building. So if I were to sum it up, I would say it's a quiet use. It's a much smaller building. It's uh, ringed off from the neighborhood, both by existing um, existing covenants and new 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 agreements they've added in the in the new covenants. And let me speak to that just to, for a minute. If you come down St. George's Road now, you end up it really out, it feels like it's out in the country. If you go down toward Cliffhurst or up from Falls to Cliffhurst, it's all in the country. There are uh, a mix of housing types. There's a lot of forests, there's a lot of hills, and it's a really very private and different place uh, in the city. If you were to connect the Belvedere apartment uh, to any of these roads, you would dramatically change the amount of traffic and the amount of, um, you know, access to the and, and that won't happen. So I would say our, our groups um, and the interested neighbors that we've worked with, which is all but a very, I would say a handful, um, and I mean two or three, um, we do support this proposal. Some of us, because we think it's the best thing we're likely to get, others because we think it's a good use and a, and a good project. So um, that is where we are. And we have an operating agreement that's binding and we have 
two covenants that are perpetual on the sites. And we have shared all that with uh, the neighbors and uh, by emails and by discussion. So I think that's what we would say about it. Thank you so much. Okay, and it looks like I have Mr. Schmidt as well here in support. So Mr. Schmidt, I'll make you a panelist and unmute you, sir. There you are, okay. Mr. Schmidt. Terrific. I thank you all. Um, good, after, good afternoon. And um, I am uh, Doug Schmidt, the president of North Roland Park Improvement Association. Um, we uh, into a process <clears throat> um, in conjunction with the other associations uh, beginning after the new year and then really picking up speed in March where we um, had a community wide Zoom um, over the next several months. We worked with the developer and uh, we communicated back and forth with our community members as we moved to negotiate an agreement with them. We had a number of objectives in our agreement. <clears throat> um, we were worried about conservation easements, screening, traffic pattern limitations, uh, lighting, stormwater, and facade. And after the strong work of Cliff Bates and his team and Bob Williams on our side, we came to an agreement that was satisfactory to address the concern community. Um, through the process, we um, didn't get 100% agreement from the community, but it was overall overwhelming support for the process. And uh, we appreciate the work of the community. We appreciate Mr. Bates and his team working with us, and we are in support of the project. Oh, well, thank you. I believe that's it for, uh, as I'm looking, um, are there any other people that you believe are in support or are also for the common users? All right, so I'm gonna go through the call-in users. If you are here in support of BMZA 2021-095, please speak up. Moving to the next caller. Again, this is if you are in support. And Mr. Murphy, I see you've raised your hand, so I will call on you in a moment once I get through the call-in users. One more. Okay, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy, you're, you're here in support? Yes, I am. Okay, um, go ahead. I would just like to echo uh, Bob Williams. We prepared three very detailed agreements, uh, which probably went through a total of about 10 drafts, were reviewed on every occasion by the neighborhoods, and I'm confident that to the extent you can achieve perfection, we have achieved a very strong protection for the neighborhood with these agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Okay, I believe that concludes the uh, testimony in support. Does the board have any questions for uh, Mr. Barry's team? No. Yeah. Nope. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Holter, you are unmuted, sir. And if you'd like to turn your camera on, you can do so. Or it might already be on. There we go. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Sam Chung uh, some questions. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chung. Um, have you, um, well, let me, let me start with one that I had, uh, I thought of the other day. Why is the parapet that you're proposing so large? If it's only to shield some, uh, material on the top, which your plan does not show, 
that there's like air conditioning units. Why is that uh, so large? Uh, we haven't made we have, we haven't made progress into our our construction documents yet, but um, typically they can be used for screening air conditioning units, like like what you say, rooftop units. I understand, but in this instance, this is much larger parapet than any any kind of parapet that I've seen over my many years of practicing. It right. almost looks like it could be uh, uh, subject to an additional floor. Uh, uh, if 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 the parapet is approved for 44 feet, then why wouldn't the building a, a fourth level floor be appropriate? That's what has me concerned. Yes, um, Mr. Holster, it's really to identify the, the the primary entrance of the building. We didn't want it to have the same height as the other parapets to, to just kind of create a monotony, but really to give an expression that this is the primary entrance. Well, that doesn't answer my question as to whether or not it, uh, the, the height of it could uh, provide the reason for a fourth floor to the building. Um, there is not enough there is not enough height for it to be able to um, accommodate another level. All right. Uh, you showed a number of pictures of, uh, uh, of the adjoining property owners and the view. Um, Mr. Hunter's uh, Cochran's property is only 300 feet from, from that. You didn't show that, did you? Um, I do have it in, in, in our exhibit that we had submitted. You did, how did you get on his property if he didn't agree to it? So, uh, I don't think he suggested that there was an agreement or that he took a picture from his property. Okay, thank you. Um, why can't you, instead of asking for a variance of 44 feet, why can't you excavate some of the hillside and go down and make it lower that way? I would say the best um, rationale for that, Mr. Holzer, is due to the technical difficulty of having to excavate. Um, so you just don't want to excavate. Well, the, the, the topography itself is already really steep, and so it would, it would provide a, a, a uh, undue hardship for us to be able to excavate that much natural soil. And so we're All very... Right. We're, what is the soil type finish. there? What is the soil type there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can. I did. Yes, I did hear your question. Um, I would. I would have to look into our um, our technical report for that, which I don't have at the moment. All right. Let me ask you another question. Of the acreage of this site, you're only using 13 to 15 percent. Couldn't you use a little bit more and spread out this building and not require a variance at all? That really has to do with the difficulty of disturbing the site, Mr. Holzer. Uh, we are trying to really limit the disturbance because there is such a great topography, to, topographical difference. And, okay. it, and it really didn't make sense to dig more into the hillside because we would have to have enormous retaining walls in order to do so. Have you, uh, for purposes of this facility, which is an assisted living facility, have you analyzed the uh, Northern Parkway sidewalk for accessibility? Uh, I, I believe Mr. Jared Barnhart would be able to comment to that question. Okay. Well, then it's, I'll it's, uh, ask it's, him. Mr. Yeah. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, I may be wrong, but I don't remember a situation where we allowed the opposition to directly question um, the applicant's team. I think I think the opposition is allowed to question a witness. I just don't know that yeah. these are the questions that are necessary. Well, yeah, I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I think he, he has, he has, 
this witness uh, spoke, spoke to certain issues. Now, you may be asking the wrong witness, um, but you know we'll, we'll we'll allow you to to get to your uh, to get through your, I guess, for lack of a better word, cross examination, Mr. Halter. But um, certainly, we want to make it relevant to the issues we have to decide. Well, I'll make it relevant to the issues you have to decide. Uh, has there been a certificate of need granted uh, to this assisted living facility by the state of Maryland? Who are you asking, sir? Yeah, I well, this is Cliff Bates. I'll, I'll, I'll address that. No, there has not yet. We're not at that. We're not at that stage yet. We will have to get one, and that will be in the process. We will do that in the process, but we have not yet. No. Okay, so you have not gotten that. So there's nothing that can assist the board other than your group's testimony as to whether or not the state of Maryland will uh, allow an assisted living facility on the basis of a certificate certificate of need, right? Is that correct? At this time, we have not submitted an application yet. Thank they you. Let me interject. Let me interject. They will, review our, they will review our plans for appropriateness and very well should issue the certificate, yes. Mr. Bates, hold on a second. Mr. Bates? Yes. Uh, is this or with that determination is it being made in the ordinary course of the the order of things that would normally do when you're doing a process development process like this yes absolutely and so we'll, we'll be required to f submit full plans and specs um and we we can't produce full plans and specs until we know whether we can build this building on the site thank you mr mr cliff based on that wouldn't that have been a logical thing to give the board of appeals some understanding of of the uh, appropriateness of this site for elderly facilities who may have to walk there, who may have to utilize the, the surrounding uh, Baltimore City sidewalks. Uh, wouldn't it uh, have made more sense to go to the state of Maryland to get a certificate of need, and then you wouldn't have to put the burden on the Board of Appeals to make these decisions and ultimately maybe be reversed when the, uh, when the state uh, reviews it. Wouldn't that have made more sense to you? Well, let me back up just a little bit. <laughs> to be clear, we're going to have to get a license from the state, not a certificate of need. And number two, you know, look, we have on-site transportation for our residents. So there's really no need for them to have to traverse off the site. <laughs> Well, people that have to work there or people that have to come and visit or elderly people that might do that certainly have problems. Baltimore City is being sued about its sidewalks right now on this very issue. And you're asking the Board of Appeals to go ahead and approve this, and then you'll deal with the state and- Mr. Holzer, is this argument or question, sir? Are you still listening facts or- you can save your summation for, for later. If you're going to examine the witness, ask them a question. Move on. The, um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand uh, the, the, last, the witness who testified about the approvals that the site plan because I I see that the uh, approval was given by the planning board in June to a, I think it's a different plan than the one they just showed up on the wall dated, uh, or on the board dated uh, July the 8th. Can someone explain that uh, uh, to me, that the, that the planning, uh, site planning review actually looked at an older plan and not the plan that you're showing the board. Could I respond to this? Yeah, who's speaking? Al Barry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Barry. Uh, the board, I think, uh, knows that the city review process involves multiple different uh, applications. The uh, site plan review committee plan was developed by our civil engineer who's with me today. There was, along with that, there were plans that were, I'll uh, say, representations and renderings to, for the neighborhood agreements that were less technical in nature. 
and those plans have been sort of updated as we go along. So there's no real inconsistency that Mr. Holzer is sort of hitting at. Mr. Barry, has that been uh, done in the ordinary course as it is normally as it normally is done in projects of this size and in complexity? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. The uh, the plans have to go through multiple simultaneous reviews. We started initially before we even went to the city with the community associations, as Mr. Williams and Mr. Smith just testified to, that resulted in agreements. There are a lot of documents that the board has in its files that are part of this uh, that explain that. At the same time, there are city, there's a preliminary city review called Site Plan Review Committee, which gives a lot of city agencies a first-hand look and the recommendations on that that come from that that then have to be ultimately complied with when, a, if the zoning board approves this, have to be complied with by the subsequent permit approvals. They include stormwater management, they include forest conservation, um, and those will all be consistent with either the board's approval and certainly the community agreements. So that's a normal course of events. We're here today for two reasons. One, to have the conditional use approval for this residential care facility. And the second is for a variance with the height. All this other material that Mr. Holzer is bringing up is, I think, extra extraneous to it. Also, I would say that he, you know, there is, you'll hear our civil engineer testify to this if you would like. There is a substantial amount of rock in that hill. And to lower it would require blasting, which we felt that the community would not be necessarily in favor of that. And so the building is built on top of the rock, not below the rock. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Holzer, anything else regarding uh, uh, conditional use and height variance? Only when we get to the merits, uh, when it's my time to get to the merits. I've asked enough questions for now. Okay. Are you through with your presentation? No, not not on the merits. Is it my time to talk about the merits now? Well, you were you wanted to examine a witness. We allowed you to do that. Is there anybody else you want to ask questions of? If not, please proceed. And uh, okay, to the merits. There's no one. There's no one else that I need to ask questions for. I I want to uh, uh, advise the board that, with all due respect, we have submitted on Monday. Uh, comments of the Cochrans in opposition to the conditional use, which I'll talk about first, and then uh, of opposition to the variance applications, which I want uh, and request that they be admitted into, into the, the record of these proceedings. But I will uh, now begin to uh, make up my presentation on the conditional use application. Okay, just so you know, those those items you mentioned are, are part of the record. You submitted them, and uh, the board has received those, and, and they will be part of the record. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I thought that that would be the case, but I just wanted to be sure. Sure. Um, the, first of all, on the conditional use, uh, the applications uh, are failure to meet the bulk regulations. The zoning ordinance contains several provisions specific to residential care facilities. One of these is zoning ordinance 14-334B, under which a residential care facility must adhere to the bulk regulations of the district and is therefore ineligible for a variance from these regulations. As currently proposed, the residential care facility exceeds the R6 height limit and requires a height variance, which the board does not have the authority to grant for this particular use. As a result, the board may not grant the conditional use. Secondly, uh, uh, insufficient uh, information. We have just gone through the presentation of the applicant, and I uh, have indicated, as I indicated before, it, it denies a protestant or someone not in agreement with the plan 
uh, the ability to re respond to this new evidence or evidence that was presented through Cliff Bates, Sam Chung, Jared, uh, and uh, we were aware of Bob Williams and, and uh, uh, his testimony. But the presentation uh, uh, prevents us from adequately and re carefully responding to their points of view. Uh, this assisted living facility uh, uh, being proposed just illustrates the lack of due process in this process, which is why it was so important for me to make that argument on the motion earlier. So uh, 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 the if I can continue on that line of, of, of uh, presentation, the glaring omission of such a statement, and when I say statement, I mean supporting evidence, uh, uh, from this suggests that instead of demonstrating conformity with the applicable zoning ordinance standards for a conditional use approval as required. It, the board is expected to look the other way and grant a, a pro forma approval. In fact, the board has been giving nothing to go on based on its own rules pursuant to Zoning Ordinance 5404 B2 little i. The board should make the determination that the application contains insufficient information to enable the board to consider it. And when I say that, I say it because the state of Maryland for an assisted living facility does provide a, a grants a certificate of need or whatever way you want to call it. In other words, they go through whether or not the topography is appropriate, whether or not the sidewalks and the entrance ways and so forth are all appropriate. I am suggesting and will suggest that many of these issues are detrimental to the community, even though the community thinks it has a better thing by signing the, these agreements. They may not, and they probably do not. So, um, so in evidence, th this is the evidence that demonstrates is detrimental to the health, safety, welfare of the surrounding community then the board does not have the benefit of receiving that. And the board can also, from a, a site plan review, the board cannot determine the appropriateness of the requested conditional use without the results of the site plan review, finally, which is designed to provide analysis of many of the issues the board must base its decision on. Zoning Ordinance 5406A, prohibits the approval of a conditional use unless the board finds, one, the establishment, location, construction, maintenance would not be detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare. Here it might be because of the sidewalks, the topography of this project. The use would not preclude, uh, by any other law, any applicable urban renewal plan. Uh, three, the authorization would not be contrary to the public interest and would be in harmony with the purpose of this code. Zoning Ordinance 5406B further states that in order to decide on the facts, the board must consider the following, the nature of the proposed site. We've already heard from Mr. Bates who said it's challenging heights. We've already heard from uh, Mr. Chong as to the difficulty of the, of the uh, area for which you're going to place elderly people on, on this site that they both described as being difficult. The, it, the, the resulting traffic patterns, have they done a traffic study? Uh, is there one required? But that's under 5406B. Um, the nature of the surrounding area, the ability for emergency vehicles. We haven't even talked about emergency vehicles getting into this property. Determination of the suitability of uh, a residential care facility 
involves all those kinds of issues. So we say that uh, it's, there has not, is not uh, enough has been uh, presented. Now, just to explain for the board what you should consider maybe while you're thinking about this, there are discernible aspects of the submitted plan that demonstrate the unsuitability of the site for residential care. It does not have its own access to the public street. All access, ingress and egress, goes through property of others. To go to and from the facility, anyone who is not in a vehicle, including the disabled, would be forced to follow the steep and narrow sidewalks along Northern Parkway, or else navigate the steep and winding driveway to the existing apartment. Three, uh, the city is being sued at the present time for failing to conform its pedestrian pathways to ADA standards. Three, the access route within the site that is depicted on the application is too steep. Inadequate ingress, egress, and interior drives for emergency vehicles is not provided. Turns into and out of the site for emergency vehicles are extremely limited by street conditions, traffic patterns, and the adjoining streets, Northern Parkway and Falls Road, are dangerous congested. The intersection has a long wait times and a failing grade. That is our position in regard to, very briefly, the conditional use application. The variance application uh, includes some of those same arguments. The proposed use is ineligible for a variance. Under Zoning Ordinance 14334B, a residential care facility must adhere to the bulk regulations of the district and is ineligible for a variance from those regulations. The board does not have the authority to grant the requested variance. I already have discussed the uh, insert uh, sufficient information, so I'm not going to go through and repeat that argument, but it's, it's the argument under the board rules C.2, again, relative to the, uh, to the very uh, variance. Under 5308B, the board must find seven different uh, requirements. Uh, and obviously, we all know the conditions are, uh, whether they're based on unique to the property, well, it seems to me it's not unique to the property. If every uh, part of the adjacent property is the same way and across the street uh, west of Falls Road, they're all the same. It's all hilly, it's all steep, and it's, and it's nothing unique about the problem. The unnecessary hardship uh, question is caused by this, the code. And it hasn't been created by uh, intentionally. Well, maybe it has been. In this particular situation, there, there could have been uh, methodologies utilized to either use more area land, so to reduce the variance required. The per the three, the purpose of the variance is not based on a desire to increase the value or income potential of the property. Well, it sure is. I mean, to be able to put this three-story uh, uh, facility on the top certainly increases the uh, income potential of the, uh, of the property. The, in, the variance will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other property in the neighborhood. Well, I'm not sure that applies. The variance will not be injurious to the use of other uh, in, uh, properties in the neighborhood. I don't, I don't think that's an appropriate issue. Um, finally, the variance will not otherwise be detrimental or, or to or endanger the public health, safety, and welfare. I think this, these uh, proposed developers should rethink the issues related, and the board should consider the issues related to the safety of people trying to get to this very difficult, challenging height building on a, uh, on a site that perhaps is inappropriate for the site. Maybe they wish to take a look at some other location. Now, the basis for the denial, it must be denied because the conditions on which the application is based 
have not been identified, submitted, and there's no showing of unique. Well, I think the neighborhood is all unique. It's all hilly. It's all steep slopes. So there's really nothing unique about this particular property. Um, we believe the variance has, uh, the applicant has not uh, shown that the variance is a matter of practical difficulty because if, if, if they really wanted to build a facility that would not present a practical difficulty, they wouldn't have built it on a hill uh, such as this, a location such as this. Finally, um, the, uh, it's interesting to know that all these agreements that the, that the neighborhood has signed and uh, that have uh, been endorsed and so forth, um, the current owners of Overlook one, and, uh, Overlook 1 and 2 chose to pursue a PUD under the old zoning instead of developing under the old zoning code. The PUD was obtained in mid-2017 via an unlawful approval, which Overlook 1 and 2 recently acknowledged their findings at the Court of Special Appeals. Nevertheless, Overlook 1 and 2 continue to pursue the approval of the PUD and are not believed to be signatories to the above mentioned neighborhood agreements. So I question and ask the question to the board, maybe there is another ulterior motive in talking about getting this variance and then could it be applied to the PUD that has to be remanded and if it can't be remanded back to the city council this board can decide it. So that eliminates uh, uh, the Court of Special Appeals in the circuit court from the approval of this process. Thank you, sir. I have no further points. Great. Um, hold on one second. All right, so um, the chair is now coming through uh, a speaker phone. So um, Mr. Holter is, has just concluded. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna change the uh, the direction a little bit as far as um, his audio. So okay, make, great, thank you. All right, so um, so Mr. Holter's just concluded. Uh, Mr. Holter, um, so you've just concluded your testimony. I see we have some people here still in opposition. I see Mrs. Boykin um, is on the line, so I will move her to, um, I will unmute her so she can speak in opposition. Ms. Boykin? Can you hear me? Uh, just barely, ma'am, if you could, could speak up a little bit. Okay. I think I made my points um, in the email that I sent to you, but I just wanted to make it very clear that uh, the boards that are, have been, the neighborhood boards that have been working with this um, development group do not represent the entire neighborhood. And there are many people who do not agree with, uh, work with this development uh, and just wanted to make that point to you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I will now go through, if there's anyone else here on the call that would like to speak in opposition, uh, please raise your hand. Um, but in the meantime, I will go, all right, so we have um, a person here. Okay, go um, ahead. Yes, can, can you unmute me under Caroline Fobb? I'm logged in via my computer as well, please. Certainly, all right, so I'm gonna mute this, this one and I'll unmute your end under Caroline Fobb. Ms. Bob? Can you hear me here? Yes. And I also needed to share my screen if you could allow that. All right. All right. Hold on one second. All right. So Ms. Bob, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass you the presentation ball. So you have to accept and then you'll be able to share your screen.
Are you able to see my screen now? Uh, yes. Yeah, so this this looks like I guess the exhibits um, <laughs> about the view from that uh, that the architect put in. Okay. Yes. Thank you for having me. My name is Caroline Fobb. I'm a neighbor and owner of 801 St. George's Road. I do not support the variances presented today. Overall, my stance is that the intrusiveness of the variances are being understated and therefore are misleading. This is the view presented. Um, I know that Mr. Sam was alluding to it, but didn't review it today, um, of the view of the Cochrane House. Um, I do, though, have a more accurate photo of, let me pull that up. This is a more accurate view from the property of showing the current building and how it does, it is viewable from the property uh, currently. And the proposed building is going to be significantly closer to this property line and clearly visible. Um, you can see that this- We don't, we don't see- in this um, week. I don't, the, we only see the web, like the WebEx link. I don't see another photograph. Oh, let me um, change my share. There it is. It has like a, oh, it, it's gone. What's that? It has like a wall, a stone yes. wall. Okay. Thank you. So just to recap, this is a more, represent, more representative photo of the view from the Cochrane property. This is the current building that extends through here. Um, this is taken this past week in the middle of summer with max foliage. Uh, so in winter, the majority of all of the building peering through here is all visible. The proposed plan is to have a building even closer to us uh, or to this property line here and um, it is therefore in clearly intrusive to the neighbors and uh, this should be included in the exhibit going forward to better represent the effect and impact that it will have on on the uh, surrounding properties. Ms. Fab, I would ask that you email that to bmza at baltimorecity.gov, please. Got it, I'll do. Okay. Um, anything else? That is all for me. All right, thank you very much. Let's see, so I'm gonna take the ball back. And if anyone else wishes to raise their hand to testify in opposition, um, please do so now. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna start going through the call-in users. If you are here to testify in opposition of 2021-095, after you hear the two beeps, please speak up. Moving to the next caller. Moving to the next caller. Moving to the next caller. Okay, um, so it appears we do not have Simon, double check for me um, that there's nobody else with hands raised or in. I've put anything in the chat. Okay. All right. We got Mrs. We got Miss Fob. Um, okay. So I think that it concludes um, opposition testimony. Um, so, Mr. Chair, would you like me to? I guess we'll go back to to Mr. Barry and his team. Yeah. Let's move back to. Um Mr. Barry, and give them the uh, final word. Okay. Thank right. you, uh, members of the board. I want to categorically uh, disagree with uh, several of the comments that Mr. Holzer made on behalf of his client. I will say I found it odd that uh, Mr. Cochran himself was not, it chose not to testify and give any reasons of his own why there should be opposition to this. All we heard was speculation on the part of his attorney that the site's not suitable, 
uh, because it will not grant the state might not grant a certificate of need, which you heard from Mr. Bates is not even needed in this case. The state has to approve it. We have to meet accessibility standards. The site plan review committee, Mr. Barnard, uh, Bart can can talk about. We have to meet accessibility requirements as part of the state's process and the city's process. So all the speculation that the site isn't suitable or won't meet this or won't meet that was pure speculation on the attorney's part rather than hearing any opposition from Mr. Cochran as to why he objects to this. It was almost implied that a shorter parapet might lead to uh, his support. The, the parapet was from a design standpoint. It went through a vigorous neighborhood design process. Um, and it's not the taller parapet is really at the entrance. Um, I would say that uh, the reasons uh, that we gave uh, in testimony today fully support the standards that the board has to find for both the conditional use and the variance. We will email you that uh, testimony right now. We'll even give Mr. Holzer a comment, a uh, copy of it to his email. We did not get copies of what he submitted to the board. Uh, to, to my knowledge, uh, we're just seeing those for the first time. Um, we think the site plan review committee addressed some of the technical questions he raised. Um, we think that the board clearly has the authority, as you know better than most, whether a conditional use meets the standards or not. You have the authority to approve a variance, which we think, as Mr. Holzer even admitted, was caused by the code. For him to speculate that maybe we should move the building or move the building into the R1 area, which comes closer to Mr. Cochran's property, it just doesn't make any sense in terms of what he really wants out of this. Mr. Mr. Cochran had the ability to correspondence with myself, with the Neighborhood Association, to actually get involved in the process. Did he want a, did he want a lower building? He could, have, he could have brought that to the Community Association. Um, did he want the building to come closer into the R1A to make it, to make it a lower building? He could have brought that. For once, he did not do it. In fact, when some of those pictures were taken that I took personally, we asked the neighbor association to ask the neighbors, including Mr. Cochran, for permission to get on their house. We never got permission to get on anyone's house to, or property to take pictures. So those were the best we could from the edges of our property. Uh, finally, I think Mr. Engel should just clear up, even though it's old history, Mr. Co uh, Holzer keeps bringing up the PUD and testimony at the Court of Special Appeals. And I think Mr. Engel, again, can, can set that. This is a different application. The Court of Special Appeals hearing was in January. Uh, this proposal was not even aware of for any of us at that point. So it, was, it could not have talked, it been in any way included in that proceeding. Yeah, exactly. Just to reiterate what uh, Mr. Barry said, uh, the PUD involved a 6'4", 148 units, multifamily uh, development by a completely different developer, uh, a Blue Ocean Realty affiliate. This, as the board has heard, this relates to a 3'4", 100, uh, approximately 100 unit uh, memory care and assisted living facility. Um, Mr. Holzer quoted me about saying it's the same building. And again, that hearing was earlier this year, around January of 2021. This application before the board was filed first in April of 2021. It had absolutely nothing to do with anything uh, the board is considering today. The PUD has been vacated. The PUD is completely irrelevant. It deals with completely different plans, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the uh, application that's pending before the board. The last thing I would add is that this is not a Trojan horse that's been implied. Uh, the community agreements were negotiated in good faith, entered into in good faith. Uh, the agreements would not allow for a fourth story to be put on the building uh, behind some parapet. Uh, so with that, I would uh, submit that unless um, I think we're we're finished with our case, I think we Feel the board has been given sufficient opportunity to approve these app this application, and I recommend that uh, for the board today. Thank you for your time. Um, so, uh, 
uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, I received a message in the chat from Mr. Holzer that uh, Mr. Cochran is willing to respond. Um, it's up to the board whether they're willing to permit this testimony after the applicant has had the last word. See James, I think he. I might have lost his audio again. Hold on one moment. <laughs> this is Sabrina. For what it's worth, I don't mind hearing it. Okay. All right. And um, so then, uh, Mr. Barry, we'll come back to your team uh, to get the last word. Mr. Holzer, Mr. Cochran. Thank you very much. Uh, in, in response to Mr. Barry's comments, the, it's very si simple. I want the developer to comply with the current zoning. I'm not opposed to a development. I'm opposed to a variance to facilitate what I would consider to be an overdevelopment. If it complies with the zoning, I don't get to have an opinion about the development. You just apply for a construction permit and build. So that's basically my position, and it has never varied. And Mr. Barry is well aware of that. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, Mr. Barry, back to you for the last word. Um, doesn't really call for a response. The, the, uh, as the board knows, complying with zoning uh, means getting appropriate conditional use approval and variances that the board has the authority to grant, we would ask the board again to consider our arguments that we meet those standards and thank you for your time today. Again, no other reasons against it, just, just the these are block. Okay. Um, okay, to conclude this. Right. Um, I guess is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Can, can you all hear James? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. They they can hear you. All right. Um, so that that'll conclude the testimony and presentations on um, on this matter. And is there anybody else we need to go back to? Or that concludes the doc. Do we need to check? Um, um, so the last one was the individual who didn't show for the very last. Doc, um, they are not coming. That was the Lake Avenue property. Um, right. We will go ahead and postpone that, figure out what happened with that applicant. Um, so there's no other matters we need to go back to. All right, uh, that'll conclude the docket. We'll proceed to deliberation. All right, thank you. Let's get. Mm -hmm.